Okay, I will uh, now call to order the meeting of the Omaha Planning Board. The planning board members that are here today are Dave Rosacker, Michael Pate, Jeff Moore, Patrick Moore, Sidney Franklin, Christine Carnes, Vice Chair, and I am Greg Rosenbaum, Chairman. Mem members of the city staff that are in attendance today are Dave Fanslaw, Planning Director, Eric England, Acting Assistant Planning Director, Mike Carter, Acting Current Planning Manager, Robert LaRocco, Planning Board Administrator, Jennifer Taylor of the City Law Department, and Lisa Agins is our Recording Secretary. Our rules of procedure are as follows. Notice of this hearing has been published. Copies of today's agenda are located on the table in front of us. You are welcome to come down and pick one up. The cases on the consent agenda will be heard first. Consent cases are perceived by the planning board to be non-controversial, have already been heard or been recommended for layover, and therefore will be read and voted on without the opportunity for your testimony. If you wish to testify, you may remove the case from the consent agenda. When each consent case is read, I will ask if anyone wants the case removed. If you do, please stand up and say so, and the case will be removed. This case will then be heard in the order in which it appears on the regular agenda after we go through the consent cases. When the case is heard, you will have the opportunity to come to the podium Clearly state your name and address and give your testimony at that time. When hearing cases on the regular agenda, the board will first hear from the applicant. After the applicant states their case, we will hear from the proponents and then we will hear from the opponents. After both sides are heard, the public hearing will be closed and no additional testimony will be permitted unless a board member requests additional information. When at the podium, please clearly state your name, address, and whom you are representing for the record. Your testimony is very important to us. In the interest of time and courtesy to others, please be short and to the point. We will try to limit each case to 10 minutes. Those directly involved in the case, please speak first. We request that large groups select a spokesperson to represent that group therefore eliminating repetitive testimony. When giving testimony, please provide new information and try not to repeat what has pre been previously said. We do ask that all speakers and others be treated with courtesy and with respect. In that regard, please remain silent while seated and please turn off your cell phones. Our decision to approve, deny, or continue a, con or continue a case made here today will be forwarded to the City Council for another public hearing and final disposition by the City Council. Conditional use permits are an exception to this rule. The Board's decision made here today on conditional use permits are final and not forwarded to the City Council. Lastly, upon the advice of the Law Department, all communications to the Board members from attorneys or other interested parties should be transmitted through the planning department so that they are made a part of the public record. The department will then transmit all that information to the board as well as to the rest of the, pu uh, as well as to the, rest of the public. Rezoning matters are an exception to this rule. A current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act can be found in a white binder on the east wall of this room. And there are no changes to the consent agenda. So we'll get started with the consent cases. Okay, it's agenda item number eight, case C10-19-251, C12-19-252, applicant Woodsonia Acquisitions, LLC. It is on for approval request preliminary plat approval of Lake Livin, a subdivision outside city limits with rezoning from AG to R7, location northwest of 168th and 4th Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Okay, seeing none. Agenda item number nine, KC 12-19-250, applicant vintage homes. It is on for approval. Request 
preliminary and final plot approval of Natterjohn, Natterjohn Farms, a minor plot outside the city limits. Property is located within the ED North Hills Overlay Resource District. Location, 6550 Rainwood Road. Would anyone wish to have this removed from consent? Seeing none, agenda item number 10, KC 10-17-46. C12-17-47, applicant 180 Maple LLC. It is on for approval. Request final plat approval of Antler View East, lots 12 through 20, outlots F, F through H with rezoning from AG and DR to MU, and a major amendment to the mixed use district development agreement for Antler View East. Location, southwest of 180th Street and West Maple Road. Does anyone wish to have this removed? You do, sir? What are you guys planning on doing over there? Well, we are approving this for now. If you wish to have it removed from consent, you can come forward and we can hear your testimony at that time and discuss it. If you want to leave it on consent, it'll go through as an approval today. Well, I live on 179th, right? Maple or 180th. Do you want to take it off, sir, and come? No, I just want to know what we're doing there. Because right now I got boring machines, I got diggers, I got people putting in flags, and I don't I, know what they're putting in. I'll tell you what, let's take it off, and then you'll have the opportunity to come forward and we can discuss it. Yeah, I just, I just want to know okay. what's going on. All right, we'll do that. So number 10 is no longer on for consent. Um, next case, agenda item number 13, KC 10 20. But oh, I'm sorry, case number 12, C 10 20 7, C 12 20 8. AZ Sutton Place LLC is the applicant. It is on for approval. Request preliminary and final plat approval of Sutton Place Replat 4, a minor plat inside the city limits with rezoning to expand the ACI. Four overlay district location 7205 and 7215 Ontario Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? You do? Uh, just a question, sir. I apologize. Um, I was not aware that item number eight is on the consent agenda. If possible, I would like to have that removed from the regular agenda so that I can be heard on that time later. Okay, we're going to take. Uh, did you want 12? No, not, not oh, 12. Just eight. All right, we're going to take 8 and 19 off. Both those will be taken off, okay? Give me a second here, and we're going to take 19 because those are related cases. And 12, you're okay, sir, with 12? Yes. Sir. All right. Does anyone else wish to have agenda item number 12 taken off a of consent? Okay, seeing none. Agenda item number 13, KC 10 20 9. Applicant Reagan Pence, Lamp Rynearson. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from R2 and CC to GO. Property is located within an ACI 2 overlay district. Location 3206 South 71st Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? I do. Okay. That will be removed. I thought I was going to be able to speak about it today. You can. Well? You, you, you removed it. When we uh, go through the uh, agenda items, you'll be able to come forward and, and give your testimony. Okay. okay. Agenda item number 14, KC 10-20-10, applicant Michael J. Hall. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from R435 to R4. Location. 4252 Corby Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Okay, seeing none. Agenda item number 15, case C10-20-11. Applicant Nathan Birch. It is on for approval. Request rezoning from R435 to R4. Location 2120 South 48th Ave. Anyone wish to have this removed? <clears throat> Seeing none, agenda item 
number 18. Case C10-20-40, applicant Patrick Garber for Robot Alpha LLC. It is on for approval request. Rezoning from GI to CC, property is located within an ACI-1 overlay district, location 3301 Leavenworth Street. Does anyone wish to have this removed? And I already took off agenda item number 19. Uh, the last case is agenda item number 20, case C8-20-15. Applicant Vintage Homes, it is on for approval. Request approval of a special use permit to allow development in the ED Environmental Resource Overlay District. Location, 6550 Rainwood Road. Does anyone wish to have this removed? Okay, we've got some changes. Uh, do we have a motion for the consent items that are on for approval? I move for approval of agenda items 9, 12, 14, 15, 18, and 20. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Horn? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Motion approved. Uh, I didn't vote. Oh, Mr. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> okay, and I don't, the one that was on uh, consent for layover, I took off, so I don't think we need a motion. Is that correct, Chris? We don't have any others? Okay. We'll get started with the uh, first two cases are administrative only, so there will not be any opportunity for a public testimony. The first case is agenda item number one, case C10-19-216, C12-19-217, applicant Lauren Johnson, Celebrity Homes, Omaha, requests final plot approval of Deer Crest, lots one through 171, outlots A through F, a subdivision outside city limits, along with rezoning from AG to R4, location southeast of 114th, and State Street. Eric. Yeah, so this is the final plat of the first phase. Um, the original preliminary plat for Deer Crest was recommended for approval by Planning Board October 2nd and approved by City Council on November 26th. Uh, the entire platted area will, will include 323 single family lots. This first, first phase includes 171 single family lots as well as six out lots. One item to note is that the applicant will need to continue to coordinate with Parks and Public <coughs> Works regarding the sewer plan uh, just south of the site um, for an acceptable alignment that will need to be shown in the final subdivision agreement. Aside from that, the city is recommending approval of the rezoning from AG to R4, approval of the final plat subject to submittal of an acceptable final subdivision agreement prior to City Council. Any questions, comments from the board? Do we have a motion? Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Okay, agenda item number two. Let the record show that Chris Carnes is going to recuse herself and has left the meeting. Agenda item number two, case C10 19 214. C12-19-215, applicant Royce Enterprises in Incorporated request final plat approval of estates at Loveland, a subdivision inside city limits along with rezoning from R2 to R4, location southeast of 87th and Pacific Streets. Eric. Yeah, so this final plat um, for estates at Loveland, the preliminary plat was approved by City Council at yesterday's meeting, January 7th, 2020. Um, this final plat is identical to that approved preliminary plat. It provides for 18 single family homes to be redeveloped um, where these existing seven properties are at this time. 
There is a detailed tree mitigation plan that will be part of the subdivision agreement, and there will be a note that will be needed to add to the final plats before sending to City Council regarding compliance with that tree mitigation. City staff is recommending approval of rezoning from R2 to R4, approval of the final plat subject to submittal of a revised mylars and acceptable final subdivision agreement prior to forwarding to City Council. Thank you, Eric. Any comments or questions from the board? Do we have a motion? A motion for the approval of rezoning from R2 to R4, approval of the final plat, su plat subject to submittal of revised mylars and an acceptable final subdivision agreement prior to forwarding the request to City Council. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Okay, that's the end of the administrative part of the meeting. So uh, from here on in, we can hear public testimony. We're going to take cases three and four together. Agenda item number three is, oh, I'm sorry. Chris, let the record show that Chris Carnes has <laughs> come back to the meeting. Uh, agenda item number three, case C3-19-229, applicant, Echo Properties and uh, Planning Department on behalf of the City of Omaha, request approval of an amendment to the future land use element to the city's master plan from low dis density residential to high density residential. This was laid over from the December meeting. Location, 4906, 4908, 4910, 4912, and 4914 Davenport Street. And agenda item number four is case C10-19-239, C11-19-224, applicant, Alco Properties, request rezoning from R435 and R7 to R7 along with approval of a PUR plan unit redevelopment overlay district. This also was laid over from the December, December meeting. Location, 4912 and 4914 Davenport Street. May we hear from the applicant, please? My name is Steve Elkin. My address is 999 South Logan Street. Suite 300, Denver, Colorado. Uh, I want to do a little bit of introduction about myself because uh, there is some rumors going around that I, an out-of-towner is coming in to build an apartment building. So I want to clarify that I am not an out-of-towner, although I do live in Colorado. I own about a thousand apartments in the metropolitan area of Omaha. I also was the uh, am. I bought the. Uh, Block, the 5,000 block of Underwood, where Creighton Medical Center is, the radio station is, and uh, Hello Holiday and uh, e the EPA or the Omaha Healthy Kids. I bought that about 12, 15 years ago. I don't think I don't know how many of you remember that. It was about 60% vacant when I bought it. I worked with Creighton Medical Centers to, to uh, relocate a bunch of the docs and the specialists into that building, and they've been there ever since. Uh, I also donated land to during the improvement of the Underwood, the whole business district as well, too, to get the off-street parking aligned. Uh, for 12 to 15 years now, I've allowed our parking lots to be used for the merchants and their customers in the area at nighttime to help keep the cars off the residential streets in that nature as well, too. I own uh, 1913 Barnum, which used to be called the Conrad Apartments. It's now called City Point. I took that building that uh, had lead-based uh, lead paint windows throughout the whole building, took all, put all brand new windows in, renovated that building, uh, including the lobby, and now we have one, hopefully a second retail tenant on that first floor. A couple of years ago, I bought Union Plaza at 16th and Jackson. Uh, just finished a complete remodel of that lobby, added a fitness area, added a lounge area for the residents and office and public, obviously bathrooms as well too, also converting that first level space into two spaces as well, too. I also own properties, as I said, a thousand apartments in La Vista and Council Bluffs, which is an age restricted apartment building. And that's pretty much my history. So I want to make clear that I'm, I'm not an out of town, I'm just coming in to build one property. Every single property I bought in the last 15 years, I still own. In Denver, I own properties that are I built 30 years ago, and my son is here today that our family still owns. And, I would say probably in 35 years I've been in the real estate business, I've 
sold maybe less than a half a dozen properties. So I'm a long-term owner. Uh, I take care of my properties, and I think I'm also a good neighbor. Uh, I think I'd like to turn the rest of it over to the architect to be more technical about the presentation, things of that nature. And I'm here afterwards to answer any questions or things of that nature as well, too. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Hello, I'm Jeff D. Old, 1717 Vincent Street here in Omaha. Um, I'll be brief with each of the cases. I'll just take them one by one. Um, the first case on the agenda has to do with the amendments to the future land use element. Um, basically, the, that's moving the, making the change to the map from low density residential to high density residential. Um, our case for doing that is um, we need to do that to do the higher density residential project um, on Davenport Street. And we are supporting that um, because it makes sense to um, provide more multifamily housing in the core of Omaha. We think that that number of households or that units will help support the um, planned rapid bus transit that's being planned along Dodge Street. Um, the two sort of go hand in hand, and um, that bus rapid transit that's being studied on that corridor is going to require higher density housing. Um, and then um, also to promote infill development in that neighborhood. Um, the rezoning of the two lots from the R4, 35, and R7 to both R7 are, I think, really fixing the the zoning map on either side of um, Steve and Seth's property is currently R7 zoning, um, both to the east and the west. Um, we basically taking the R435 and making that the R7 and sort of cleaning up the zoning in that area. The, that's associated with the, the final case on the docket, which is the planned unit redevelopment. We chose to pursue the planned unit redevelopment in lieu of going to the Zoning Board of Appeals and asking for waiver after waiver to make the project happen. Because the PUR um, being the relatively new tool in the um, zoning handbook allows us to work with city staff on the design of the project. The current R7 zoning doesn't really make it feasible between the two lots to fit in the 21 unit apartment building that's being proposed. Um, of those 21 units, we're planning five studio units and one and 16 one-bedroom units. The parking associated with that will be on a one-to-one -one, um, basis, so one parking stall per unit that we're providing. And pursuing the PUR allows us to sort of get that program right-sized into those two lots that we're working with. So we're looking for waivers on the side setbacks to um, 10 feet on the side yards, 15 feet on the rear yard, and then a 25 feet on the front yard, um, which is consistent with the, the street wall along the north side of Davenport. Um, working with the city staff on the design, um, essentially what we've been doing is we've been following the infill guidelines that were developed by the planning department. And that's taken us from sort of a, a flat roof design where we began um, with smaller windows on the elevations um, with one material. And we've adjusted the design to include two gable roofs to fit more in the character of Davenport Street in that section of Dundee. Um, we've increased the window sizes of the, that front elevation and on all four sides of the building. Um, ensuring that the building really talks to the um, residential street, um, which is sort of in opposition to a lot of the slip-ins that we saw um, go into that Dundee area um, in past years. Um, the entrance to the building um, more dire is directly connected to the sidewalk so that um, it's more welcoming to the street. And then we've added more primary materials to the building. So it's more or less set um, into two halves where we're using brick as one half of the building under one of the gabled roofs, and then a cementitious panel that has some depth or articulation with battens on the other half of the building. Um, the brick wraps along to the west side a little bit, and then the cementitious panels are make up 
primarily the site elevations. And then over the last month, since we had the, the layover, we had time to respond to city staff comments in the urban design division to work on the rear elevation, where we added more windows and brick to the rear of the building also. Um, so the PUR process has allowed us to enhance the design based on those infill guidelines set forth by the urban design division. Um, we are, this is located in the Dundee Historic <coughs> District. Um, and as we sort of look at what that district, how that's set up, um, it is a pretty eclectic um, landmarked um, district. I, I think we count 14 different architectural styles throughout the district, um, including everything from um, Queen Anne and Italian re resonance um, revivals to cases of prairie style architecture, some modern architecture, and some vernacular architectures. So it is a pretty eclectic mix of buildings. Um, residential and commercial throughout Dundee. And as we read the infill guidelines, um, one thing that we're careful to do is not to engage in historic mimicry with the building that we're proposing. So our design, I would characterize it as leaning more towards the modern side. Um, whereas working with the city staff, we're trying to find elements that are sort of compatible with its context. So adding the gabled roofs, making sure that we have larger windows, um, but what we don't want to get into is um, trying to recreate an old looking building um, with new materials. Um, we believe that we should be doing something of its time and place. So I would say that what we, as the design continues, what might be a little bit lacking is sort of the addition of um, the, the level of detail that you find in some of those older craftsman style houses. Um, which usually happens during the design process um, as we get through schematic design and design development. With the planned unit redevelopment process, essentially we're trying to sort of right size the building to the lot, get the bulk and the massing figured out, the fenestration, what the roof lines should be, its orientation on the site, how you approach it, arrive at it. Um, and then get that through planning board and city council. As the design develops, as we sort of get past this point, that's where we start to really get to study the materials that we're using, understand how the windows should be detailed, whether those should have um, cast stone sills or not, whether the lintels should be expressed, whether we should be exploring um, alternate core scenes on the brick facade, um, whether the parapet should have more depth or not to it. So there's a sort of refined level of detail that usually happens in the design development process before we get into our true working drawings, um, where we understand the detailing of the project a lot clearer and how that exp um, impacts the aesthetics. Um, so I I'd say that we have the, the bulk of the project designed, what the profile should be, how it fits on the site. But as design continues, sort of that higher level of detail and craft will start to be figured out and expressed. Okay. So I'll Jeff. leave it at that. Jeff, just a question. Have you had neighborhood meetings? Yes, we've met with, um, earlier in the fall, we had sort of email correspondence with the Dundee Memorial Park Neighborhood Association. We thought we were going to be on the planning board docket in November. So we initially did a, an email conversation with that group. Um, we've met with the Midtown Neighborhood Association. And Monday evening, I was able to meet with the, the board for the Dundee Neighborhood Association. And in your assessment, how do you feel those meetings went all right? Um, I would say that in my assessment that there was sort of a range of opposition. Um, and I would characterize the opposition as partly having to do with the nature of the project itself, um, that it's um, too dense, it doesn't, um, we are removing a single family house from the R4 through the R435 lot. Um, so there's some opposition to that. Um, and then just the nature of the 21 units being added to, added to that street. So I think there's some concern about just the nature of the project itself 
And then there's also concern about um, whether the project fits what, what the Dundee style is, whatever that might be. Um, so um, it, it's, there's aesthetic concerns, I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Scott Dobby with Omaha by Design, 618 South 11th Street here in Omaha. Um, you know, I think no development project is perfect. Um, I expect we're going to hear some really genuine and reasonable opinions on, on both sides of this issue. Uh, and we, we encourage that. Uh, we definitely encourage collaboration and, and uh, neighborhood participation in helping to shape the future of uh, their context. However, there are two broader issues that I'd like to maybe just bring before you today, if I could, and those are density and design. And I'll speak to why we at Omaha by Design believe that these are so important uh, and how they perhaps apply in a case such as this. Uh, first with density, um, you know, we, we begin by supporting the city's goals uh, in increasing the core and really building for a sustainable and livable future. Uh, through uh, growing to appropriate levels of density. Uh, when we do that, we see that it provides additional housing in areas that are in high demand. Dundee is certainly in high demand, very desirable place to live. Uh, that leads to greater walkability, uh, which leads to less dependence on personal automobiles. And you, know, you see that certainly as a draw in this case, where you're just two-tenths of a mile from uh, a station on what will be the city's biggest investment in public transportation in a generation. Um, you know, I'm not here to say what the perfect number of units per acre is in this, in this given sense, uh, but certainly um, I, I believe that we see that it could be increased in this case. You have two lots, one is vacant, the other is, uh, unless I'm mistaken, it has one unit of housing in it. Uh, if we see that increasing uh, across the two uh, lots to a number of like 21 units, I think is what I heard, uh, that's, if you think of it, that's 20 times more people uh, with access to the, the schools, to um, close access to jobs and education and transportation. It's 20 times more people that are patronizing uh, local shops and restaurants, that are helping to keep those storefronts occupied and, and vibrant and leading to uh, entrepreneurship and economic development that comes from small businesses. And all that happens uh, with nothing near a 20 time increase in the cost of providing city services. It's a far more efficient way, density is, of um, uh, paying for our police and fire and sewer and snow removal and all those many things that already are pre-existing uh, to a large degree in that case. Uh, so density certainly, and then also on the design side, this is where it's naturally most subjective. Um, you know, myself as an architect and a Dundee resident, uh, I, I would find what I see in these drawings uh, as a handsome addition to my own neighborhood. But I completely understand and respect that some of my uh, neighbors would, would disagree, would have a different vision for what um, design compatibility with Dundee might look like. And so I think rather than the subjective side, we have to look to the few objective uh, guidelines that we do have. And the city's own infill design guidelines were mentioned. Uh, there's also uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, which is kind of a leading authority on these matters, and they speak uh, much to the idea of being compatible but differentiated. And I think that's, in a lot of ways, the most of what we can ask of uh, infill design. Um, I love, like anybody, the old 100-plus-year-old uh, building with, you know, intricate masonry work and, and all the things with the craftsman and the handmade. But uh, frankly, if, if we were to ask for exactly that today, it would be such a luxury product because of the cost of labor that we'd be running counter to some of our goals. Um, and unfortunately, then, if we push too hard that way, we end up sometimes with a, like a mimicry, I think is the term Jeff used, uh, kind of a cheap photocopy sometimes of a, of a truly historic building. And so instead of copying, we try to be compatible, and I'll be brief here, but generally uh, we look for things like does it address the street? It's not like the old slip-ins of the past. It's got a front door. Uh, does it respect the context? Well, it matches the, the setbacks of all the adjacent buildings. Uh, it, it minimizes uh, surface parking, which is something that a lot of past developments have not done. 
Uh, and then in terms of building form, it, it takes those cues from the neighborhood, from the vernacular, with the gable roof shape, with the relatively simple and straightforward form and use of materials, and with the subdivided scale that shows kind of like two faces on the facade. Um, and finally, closing with just the quality of materials and landscaping, it's, you know, it's in the details that it matter. And so that's why, you know, working with city staff, we know that those details will be followed through with the brick and the fiber cement siding and those highly durable, long-lasting materials. So finally, in closing, I just say um, thank you for your time. And, and you know, we, we support in the sense that we see this um, as an example of a step towards achieving our goals of increased density, walkability, and sustainability. Uh, through the details of design uh, and design that is compatible but differentiated so as to be both respectful of its context and true to its time. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Scott. Yes. Were you so involved by design? Were they involved in, in, in helping the design or, or the look of, of these projects? Uh, I have made some brief comments uh, to an early draft that I saw uh, uh, from the old Anderson. Um, we've also spoken with uh, some members of the, the community and the Dundee Memorial Park uh, Association uh, for their input as well. Um, but we welcome uh, being a part of more of those conversations. Okay, but you weren't necessarily directly involved in the in the, in the design. You're not mm -hmm. required to be involved in. Oh the, no, certainly not. Okay. No, no, uh, here so, of our own accord. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Seeing none. Are there any opponents that wish to speak? If you're in a, how many people, uh, come on down, how many opponents that are here, raise your hand please. How many of you are going to speak? If you want to come down and take a seat in the front, that'll, that'll be helpful. Hi. And just give your name and address please. I'm Sarah Nelson. I live at 4806 Underwood Avenue. What was your first name? Sarah. Okay, thank you. So I'm wearing two hats today and I'll be brief on my first one. I'm Sarah Nelson the Dundee resident, and then I'm also the co-president of the Dundee Memorial Park Association. My co-president, Mary, is here with me today as well. So my hat as Sarah Nelson is that the message that the neighbors have been receiving about the demolition of the current house that resides on 4914 Davenport Street is that it, it deserves to be demolished because it is dilapidated. Um, I strongly disagree with that. It is not dilapidated by evidence of the fact that it was sold in 2016 for the price of $125,000. So that does not, um, those two facts don't um, fit together for me. So I'll leave that there as Sarah Nelson. I wrote you all a letter, so you all got my notes there. Um, as Sarah Nelson, as Dundee Memorial Park Association co-president, we also do not believe that this house should be demolished, but we do understand the city's goals in helping the Omaha Rapid bus transit be successful and that we are pushing more density in that area. Um, one thing I'd like to say though, is this is a non-arterial street. It is a residential street, so please take that into consideration. Um, we spoke with Jeff on Monday, as he said, uh, it was a very it was a very great conversation. I was very thankful with how open he was to receiving our comments about the aesthetics of the building. We, as designed right now, we appreciate the brick, uh, we appreciate the gable, but we don't feel like that's enough. Um, according to Omaha's Urban Design Handbook, new development should be designed to conserve and or enhance the historic the historic character of existing urban districts. We don't feel that this design does either of those things. As you drive down Davenport, you will see um, covered and wrapped around porches. You will see um, roof forms with gables and dormers. You will see incredible masonry. But you will also see that this block has had a lot of things done to it rather than for it. The slip-ins, um, the, the, the apartment buildings on the residential street. The, so it, it hasn't. He's, Scott was right that this, you know, it, this block could definitely use a little bit of love, let's just say. So um, we are open to allowing this development to happen. We would just like it to look a little bit more like Dundee. So Thank that's you, Sarah. what I will say. Any other opponents? Hi there, my name is Mary Green. 
and I'm at 5106 Western. I'm a Dundee resident, and I'm speaking for myself as a Dundee resident. Um, I'm speaking in, in a opposition to this. Um, those of us who live in Dundee live there because we love older homes, and I prefer that everything possible be done to preserve the existing unique house built in 1911 at 4914 Davenport. You know, I support infill and density, and I agree with many of the things Scott said. I, you know, we want to have an improved uh, transit system, but I prefer that housing be of scale with the existing neighborhood housing. There could be something such as turning the existing house into a duplex or putting in fourplexes, other things that are of scale with the rest of the, of the block. And the proposed apartment building is significantly larger, it's significantly taller than the other buildings on the block. Um, and I'm also concerned about the design. I know that can be subjective, but I feel like it's um, rather unattractive design. It's very plain. Um, there are a number of unattractive buildings that really deteriorate from the block, as well as we do see several apartment buildings that are quite attractive. So I um, feel that while you, are, you would like to increase density, and that's great, could we at least ask for some uh, more attractive features? And I think the planning board should be striving to maintain the unique characteristics of the older homes and buildings. Um, that's why the neighborhood is so popular, is because of those characteristics. And uh, I think exist, having the planning board um, help us maintain the existing grace and charm of the neighborhood is important rather than enabling the neighborhood to further decline with unattractive larger buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any others? Need your name and address, please, sir. My name is Alan Rao, and uh, I live at 4908 Chicago. Um, been a member of the neighborhood for 40 years, and I feel like the new guy on the block. <laughs> so, uh, and I know I don't want to be repetitive, and, and I do appreciate your point of view, and, and I didn't realize your involvement in the community, and I do appreciate that. So, um, so uh, number three on the letter here, uh, excuse me, number one, where it said he has not met, but apparently he has, and I, and I, again, it, uh, the dialogue has been very helpful for me too. So I, I appreciate that. So, my biggest concern, and I took these yesterday, right about twilight. Uh, to show you the love that so many people have for this neighborhood, and it's very unique. It's one of a kind, and I know I've said this the last time I was here. Um, uh, it's known all over the world, if you can imagine that. To stand in the yard and someone comes by and says, where's the Buffett grocery store? And I proudly point down the street. It's been beautifully renovated. Um, the trolley stop, I took a picture of that. And I, and I, uh, idea of mimicking, I understand that, and, but there's also a thing of uh, designing something with a nod to the past, and how deep that nod is, I guess, is sometimes up to uh, uh, the observer a little bit. Uh, the Hart Building, I just went under a renovation, and I don't know how much they spent, but I saw Masons there for three months. If you ever hired a Mason, <laughs> they're not making minimum wage. It's a beautiful renovation and remodeling. Uh, can you imagine if it had been gone, you know, so, and I didn't know you were involved with that other strip there, the Kellogg holiday and so on. Uh, I took a picture of it at night. Um, Better Homes and Garden, uh, that building there, has done a huge expense for months. And as I walk every morning, I'm a retired teacher now, so. Um, the Dundee Bank, as I just said, the, the Buffett grocery store, you know, so. We thought we'd see <coughs> Paul McCartney and Warren Buffett sitting not too far from these buildings. They could have eaten anywhere in the world, but they chose here. It's a special place. Um, and just a typical, and are they mimicking each other? Perhaps, perhaps not, you know, so. But I like the idea of um, to do something with a nod to the past, so. And of course, I don't know how much money was spent on the Dundee Theater, but if you think about it, <laughs> It's the last community movie theater that we have. And um, 
movies that I've never seen before. My wife and I are movie buffs, and uh, you know we've never seen the Academy Award shorts. So it's a special place, and it's one of a kind. The letter that I put there, and I and I do apologize, it's an error now, and, and I did know the procedures of who to get it to first and so on, but and I do appreciate your coming and visit. But I'm very concerned with the historic house, um, and it doesn't seem to nod deep enough to the past of the new project. So the families of these homes have endured the parade of history during the Great Depression and the wars. These families have helped build this great city. These homes are part of a huge canvas. We heard uh, no matter how large a city becomes, it's still a collection of neighborhoods and will always be, whether it's New York City or London or whatever. And, I, and as I'm looking at the larger context, as I understand the better, I mean, maybe we need a better communication with all the neighborhoods about the, the bus system and what we all share equally in, in this development. But um, as we grow, can we do this with wisdom and without losing the heart and soul? So thank you. Thank you, Alan. Oops. Hello, Dan Rock, 307 South 53rd Street, um, just a neighbor. Thank you for your service on this board. Thank you for your uh, involvement in the community and your effort to uh, invest in the neighborhood. We, we do appreciate it. And the communication has been very cordial. We appreciate that. But I am here to oppose it, and that does, never feels good. Uh, but this is important enough to take time off work and come down here. Um, you know, this is an R4 property. It was a house, a residential house that burnt down, so now it's an empty lot. The other lot is a, a residential property, a single family house. So you have R4 in the middle, R7 on each side of it. Um, the R7s on each side of it are slip-in apartments that happened in the 1960s, 1970s that really tore up our neighborhood. Um, when you drive through the neighborhood and you get to this part of the neighborhood, your heart just kind of breaks because you see those slip-ins from the 60s and 70s. And now here we have another one trying to go in now. And so this is, we want to flip the slip-ins back to single-family houses. We want to do what they're doing out of West Side with single-family houses here. Uh, this is not what we wanted. We want to do the opposite of this. Um, the impervious coverage of the, of the plot is almost um, line to line. And, um, you know, they're asking for R7, but with that additional addendum to the future plan, it really makes it more like R9 or R11, if that was a thing. Um, it makes it extremely dense. And he was talking about lentils and cast stone. The plan we saw had none of that. It's modern, and he admits it's modern. Um, he's not attempting to blend in. He's intentionally trying to not blend in. Um, with no detail, I think is how he described modern, no detail. There's 21 units and 21 spaces for cars underneath. Um, maybe everybody has one car, but there's no extra parking on this street now. And if your friend comes over, there won't be any place for them to park. Um, so it doesn't fit. I wish they would build something that did fit. It'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Fred Wolf, 5003 Davenport Street. Um, we moved from a really nice neighborhood by Hanscom Park in 1963, and it's still a really nice neighborhood. But I lived for 10 years on 50th Avenue, just south of Dodge, up the street from Dan Rock. I've lived in my current house 32 years. I lived in several apartments for a couple years each between the two houses. I worked on the corner of 50th and Dodge at the gas station or the drugstore for 25 years or more. So there, there's quite a connection for me. And from having a paper route and uh, getting the newspaper and uh, just being around Dundee forever, there, there's a little historical duress on Dundee. Um, in about 1965 or so, maybe a little later, 
N.P. Dodge, whose sales office was in the current Goldbergs, decided they wanted to build a 13-story tower on 50th and Dodge. They bought up all the real estate from 50th to 51st, excluding what was then Western Security Bank. All the houses on Capitol Avenue on both sides, north side and south side of the street. Um, fortunately, that, that fell through. And if you look at Dundee now and you look at it back in 63, that it's pretty similar to what it was. But that is because of the tenacity of the neighborhood. I believe it was one guy that owned a drugstore on 50th and Grover that pretty much got the N.P. Dodge Tower stopped. Then later on, where your property is, Safeway wanted to build, tear down the health clinic on down and build a, a big Safeway store. I believe that's what maybe got the uh, neighborhood association started. Um, on 50th and Dodge, where, where Cole's drug is, Walgreens wanted that and had some purchase agreements for the properties west of there, but Don Klein that owned Chris Drug wouldn't sell. And Denny Moran that owned the Dundee Theater and the properties along 50th Street when Walgreens went to their second option wouldn't sell. They should probably both get an award from the city. The, the changes would have been devastating. Um, where the Dundee Community Garden is, there was a proposal for maybe eight to 12 condos on that lot years ago. And these, these things would have just changed Dundee. It, it wouldn't be Dundee anymore if any of these changes had gone through. Um, people come and look around Dundee and it's like the play the Playhouse put on a couple years ago. I love you, you're perfect, now change. And it, it's just uh, development isn't, I believe, the issue. <clears throat> I think most people in Dundee would love to see Davenport from 49th to 50th a little bit of sprucing up. I, uh, maybe a couple of fourplexes or a sixplex or, or something. But 21 units with underground parking, and, and not enough parking. If there's a married couple or a guy and his girlfriend living together, you're out of parking already. And like several people have said, parking's an issue. And the more people you have, I believe it becomes a little bit less of a walkable neighborhood. Um, yeah, the parking is short. The, oh. And then another big change that, that uh, Lanny McNichols, who saved the streetlights years ago, also went to bat for the neighborhood. They wanted to make 52nd Street and Underwood Avenue, which are collector streets, they wanted to upgrade them so that in time they could be widened to four-lane streets from Leavenworth, I believe, to uh, Maple. So. Uh, you know, the, the tenacity of the neighborhood has served the neighborhood well, and the neighborhood is very walkable, and although it's changed significantly since 1963, it still looks pretty much the same. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any others? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Does the board have anything? Questions? I, have a, I have a question for yeah. Jeff. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Jeff the old 1717 Vincent Streets. Thank you. Um, you had talked about some things that may change and, and some design elements that were still open. Could you go back through that for me and, and talk about? what considerations you're still making. Right. So if I can back up and explain the process a little bit. So our, you know, if we're working on something that's as of right, if, if a project that we're doing fits within the zoning and we can just design something, go into work and drawing, submit a building permit um, without going through these extra steps, um, we'll go through a, a pre-design phase where we'll work out what the program is with the client and sort of get a base understanding of what, what the project is. 
And then we go into something that's called schematic design, where we refine the project more, work on the floor plans, get a sense of the building elevations, what the massing is, and so on. And then the final design phase before we go into actual working drawings, we'll study what the materials are in further depth, we'll understand what the wall sections are, um, really get a further understanding of what design design is before we go into several and several weeks of working on the details and the engineering of the project and things like that. With the planned unit redevelopment process, and to some degree we've gotten sort of well into schematic design, but we haven't formally started schematic design with Steve and Seth. So we're so sort of somewhere between that pre-design and schematic design phase where we haven't gotten to the design development phase where we're making our window selections and talking to manufacturers and understanding that this half of the window should be operable, there should be a mold down the center, it should be broken up into so many lights, understanding how that window fits into a cementitious panel wall and the depth of that window, what the trim around it should be, how that window might fit in a brick wall with the 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 sill of the window wants to be, what, how the lintel is expressed. Um, sort of that, that's a level of design that starts to happen in design development um, as we understand what materials are that we're working with, as we're budgeting the project with a general contractor who might be on board and sort of comparing the design to whether we're within budget, out of budget, things like that. Um, and working with material manufacturers. So there's sort of a level of refinement that we're clearly not at. And I think sometimes when we release renderings, we start to draw this and release it to the public. It doesn't leave a whole lot to the imagination because the design really isn't complete yet. So there are things like the, the window lintels, like have we thought about whether they should be cast stone or whether there should be a soldier course underneath the brick windows it would start to add some depth and character to the facade that's a level of detail that we're clearly not at and that generally wouldn't happen until that design development phase when we really understand the project so it, it would be how we're articulating the openings um, the you know it was mentioned that you know, a lot of Davenport has on the single family homes wrap around porches with steps up. Um, there's some depth to the porch um, that sits in front of the house. It's a little bit more welcoming and inviting for a single family house. Those are elements that you find throughout Dundee. Um, whether or not as we work on the entrance to this um, apartment building, I, we, we wouldn't sort of take a wrap around porch clipped from another building and then tack it onto this apartment building. But as we further the design, we'd start to look at what the front entrance is and the nature of the canopy and what the landscaping really is leading up to that front door to start to talk, to pick up on the characteristics that you might start to have on that wraparound porch in a single family house. Are you pretty set on the gray burnished um, base CMU and the brick? chosen so I, I think the so the, the gray burnished CMU is primarily on the the podium level so the podium level is the first floor where the parking will exist part of that ends up being buried um, as you go towards the, the rear of the site um, so that ends up being a, a ground floor detail and I think that's certainly something that we could explore whether that's the appropriate choice um, wrapping the podium and then the, the brick itself we've said that it's brick and we think some modeling to the brick would look good to start to break that up but we haven't talked to any of our brick manufacturers or suppliers and really worked out the tone of brick that we're going to deal with or what the composition of um, the brick is whether there's some lighter tones whether there's some accents within that um, again, that's sort of something that would happen in our design process and design development. Um, but that kind of thing is something that you know, we'd be happy to, as we do that um, 
manufacturer research um, to bring three different samples to the neighborhood and say, which one of these do you like, or which of these three brick pellets would you think would work in the neighborhood? So are you open to suggestions from the neighborhood about changes to exterior finishing? If, if the, we're open to that conversation, definitely. Um, what we're probably not, um, I, I think that conversation, we would want to keep that in the context of we are pursuing what tends to be more of a contemporary building. So we're not interested in necessarily taking Queen, out, Queen Anne elements or Neo-Victorian elements and tacking them onto the building. And it needs to make sense within the context of the architecture. But Monday evening, it was helpful for me to hear what the neighborhood's concerns were, that you know, the, the idea of the wraparound porch, and that can be more of an inviting um, element um, that maybe we could express more on our project. And then our facade, it does have some depth in plan. There's a, a fold towards the center of it that sort of implies a breakage of plane. Um, that's something that we, you know, rather than adding gables and dormers over all the windows, I, I think we can continue to explore the depth of the facade. Um, yeah, but, but, but within the context of the, the infill guidelines. Yeah, Steve, I, I was going to ask you uh, if you could come up, please. And, and, and you know, uh, he Steve, did a nice... Steve, give your name and address. Oh, um, please Steve Elkin, please. 999 South Logan Street, Suite 300, Denver, Colorado. Thank you. Uh, Jeff did a nice job of describing what could happen, but I, I'm looking to see, you know, as the neighbors have come up and voiced their concerns, how committed are you to, you know, working with them? And it sounds like you're a good neighbor sure. wh wherever you built, but... You know, there are a lot of concerns about the structure. If the, if the neighborhood wants to designate a couple people to become part of the design team with us and the city staff, I have no problem with that. I also yeah. want to mention another project <laughs> I forgot to mention, and that was the old uh, smoke pit on Farnham. Oh, nice. So I don't know if you know what it used to look like. I, I just I finished, finally finished redoing that not too long ago. Looks nice. So I think we're very respectful, uh, you know, maintaining character to all of our buildings. Uh, a building in Denver three years ago, we actually got an award for our exteriors and things of that nature. The and blending, I know that, I know that when, you, when you bring in the public to help with aspects of the design, it's it's not going to please everybody. That's why I, I, said, mean, that's why yes. I said a few. <laughs> yeah, but at least you're willing to work with yes. them to, yes. to bring them on board so that they yes. can they can have a voice in, in, in the project. So yes. thank you very much. Uh, Sarah or Jeff maybe can answer the same question but I'm going to ask anyway but kind of getting back to, to all this you can I think you can kind of tell that we're, we're just kind of worried about the the um, interaction with the neighborhood and how the building fits into the neighborhood but did you ever at all consider more of a vintage look or or a, or a design because you mentioned Jeff can more contemporary you didn't want to really lose that contemporary look Pictures don't do justice. The the renderings that we have in here really don't do justice. I don't think to the to what it maybe looks going to look like. It just you know the renderings, right? Mm -hmm. But when you take a look at that neighborhood and some of the history of that neighborhood, design really doesn't fit very well. It's fine. It's nice looking, but it doesn't fit. So did you ever give any consideration to more of a vintage look? So Jeff, the old seventeen seventeen Benton Street. Um, the, the design began with. The, the program, the, the number of units that we were trying to fit on the lot, and that ends up with more of a sort of, it defines the bulk of the building, um, meaning that it's, it's a, put it simply, it's a, it's a box, right? There's not a whole lot of push and pull available um, as we're trying to fit in the number of units, the five studio units and the 16 one-bedroom apartments. And then there's recessed balconies that are a part of that. They're fitting within that bulk of envelope. So it doesn't give us a whole lot of um, room on the site. Cost. To, to cost has an impact on it. And, and yeah. cost, right. And, and so it doesn't give us a lot of room to um, sort of add those vintage elements within the setbacks that we're working with on the, the side yards, the front yard, and the rear yard, things like adding 
um, in dormers and things of that nature. Do you think if, if you did do some, if you did infuse some of the more historic look, do you think you could command a little bit higher rent rate? Well, that'd be a question for whether Steve believes that his experience on the market. I mean, if it comes down to cost, you know, it's cost per unit, you want to make sure you're getting a return, and so you know, that's a function of the rents. It's a hard question to yeah, answer, please, please but I also... Your name and address. Oh, there. again? Okay, I'm sorry. Steve Elkin, 999 South Logan Street, Suite 300, Denver, Colorado. Uh, I, I think as, as we evolve, again, with city staff and with comments, I think we will be able to pull off some details that brings into the neighborhood, just like we have done in other developments, not only in here, but also in Denver and Kansas City and some other places as well, too. So okay. uh, I have a private ownership. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, so on our last building, what we did, we actually took uh, three different uh, brick colors and incorporated into that. So we did another building for Starbucks. The Starbucks wanted just a CMU building because they wanted less rent. So what I did, I said, I'm not going to just own a CMU building. And so we incorporated every fourth course of brick. So now it's CMU with four courses of brick. Because right. Starbucks may be gone in five or seven years, but I'm rolling that building for a long time. So well, the next it, person went. Yeah, so it, it sounds like you, you're all Yeah, so our, our goal is yeah. to make it a private ownership building, too, being cost conscious, being sensitive to the neighborhood, and being, you know, again, a good neighbor that I have been. Very good, and we appreciate it. So I, can, I would advise you to just continue to have dialogues with the neighbors and make sure that you're getting them involved. But one last question. Are there any uh, neighborhood covenants that are required for this project. Jeff the old seventeen seventeen Benton Street. No, there's not. There are no covenants. No. Okay. Neighborhood association, maybe some are you familiar with any? I don't know. I'm just asking the question. Are you calling somebody up? Yeah, I'm, let's call uh, Sarah. Sarah. Right. And if I could just sort of add on to um, your previous question. Um, the infill guidelines that we've been trying to follow, um, again, I mentioned the issue of um, not discouraging historic mimicry, but um, as the infill guidelines apply to historic districts, what they do require is sort of a more attention to craft and detail. So quality materials, well-detailed materials, things of that nature. And so th that, that is something that the infill guidelines look to. And I think that's where we would start to look for inspiration and incorporating more historic elements that, that are compatible to today's time and sure. age. And Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. OK, sir. Sarah yeah. Nelson, 4806 Underwood Avenue. Um, Dundee Memorial Park Association. Um, no, no covenants. The house being torn down did contribute to the historic district, however. Um, what, what do you mean by contribute? It was a, the roof line um, was a four, was it four point gable roof, uh, covered front porch. So it contributed. Um, so it's kind of similar look to some of the rest right. of the units. And, yeah. Yeah. But Can there's I, no covenants that, that no. determine what the houses or the structures need to. Correct. Like Can I say something for 30 seconds that sure. I forgot to say? Absolutely. So one example of something that we as Dundee Memorial Park Association love is the Kirk Davies building that was it's right across from Pitch. It's a new building. It has a human scale. The roof is set back. I think there's even one or two tiers of a setback. We love that building. So I think that, I think that there are ways to keep a, a modern look in consideration of the historical district. Um, so I would just like to say that the four-story flat wall that is being proposed could be different. Well, right. and it sounds like you're, you're going to have the chance or, or somebody from, from your group or neighborhood so. yeah. is, is going to be able to work with them. And so we would love it. It, it might not be everything you've always wanted, yeah. but sure. it sounds like they're willing to work with you. So that's all you can ask, I yeah. guess, at this that's point. That's good. Yeah. So you that's know, good communi keep yeah. the communication. Yeah. That's good, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? I guess my, my comment would be that typically on a PUR, we are very aware of and comfortable with what we're voting on before we do so because we have the opportunity as a city to hold you to that 
design and hearing that things are still open to changes makes me a little bit uncomfortable at this point. I'd rather see the final design that you come to with the neighborhood, personally. We've recently done that with other developers as well. Yeah, that, that's kind of where mine was going to. Historically, as a board, we've you know, wanted to see the final product before we've come to a final decision. So I mean, my recommendation would be a layover if you guys would be okay with it. Um, any other comments or questions? I'm going to turn it over to Eric. I do have a question for you, Eric, and I had asked you earlier, because um, we've got some other uh, agenda items with the buffer yard setback and that. I want you to, to address this. This is a large building going on and kind of being slipped into this these two lots, so if you could address that. Can I make a comment quick, Eric? Sure. I just also want to say I really appreciate the cordial relationship that you've maintained with the neighborhood. I think that's fantastic, and the fact that you're willing to meet with them and discuss these things I think is, is, is really um, fantastic, so thank you for that. Okay. Um, is your question specifically to the any buffer yards, buffer yard to the properties to the north? To the north. Okay. And, and the setbacks on the side, let's do it. Okay. Um, so, yes, the, so right now you have half of the property that zoned R7, the other half is R435. If the rezoning for the entire site was to go to R7, typically the buffer yard requirement to the R435 property and the R535 property to the north would be 30 feet based on the height of the proposed structure. However, based on the existing depth of the lot, there, the zoning code allows a reduction based on that dimension when it's less than 150 square or 150 linear feet. Mm -hmm. This property, I believe, is 136 feet in depth. So your that 30 foot buffer yard that would typically be required is reduced to 13 feet six inches. Furthermore, the PUR is requesting to go down to five feet. That would be to the parking area. The actual building would be 15 feet from the north property line. So the, the 13 feet could be the distance from the building to the property line. By code. By code. Yes. But we're at 15 foot. To the building. To the building. But five feet to the to the parking. to the north parking stalls. Okay. And there's a there's a wall and enclosure. There's a grade change as you go. It falls down from the east as you go west. To, to stay on those same um, other setbacks, there, there is no buffer yard requirement to the east, west, or south because those properties are all zoned R7 or R8. Um, but, you know, the PUR, there, there are several waivers that are being requested as part of the PUR, which is, as we've talked about in the past, is not uncommon with our more suburban style zoning code <coughs> when we deal with these infill projects. So the front yard setback, 35 to 25 feet, the interior side yard setbacks from 12 to 10, the rear setback from 25 to 15, as I mentioned. Then there's also site area per unit, impervious coverage, floor area ratio, parking, the buffer yard, and um, perimeter landscaping. So I, unless you have any other specific questions nope, at this time, I'll probably uh, just kind of lay out the two different cases yep, and we can go from there. Uh, specifically for number three, the uh, this is the amendment to the future land use map. Um, so the applicant submitted uh, the requested change from low density residential to high density residential. Um, there are two properties directly to the east that have R7 zoning and have multifamily buildings already in existence. The city um, with this application is also requesting that those change to high density residential to reflect the, the existing R7 zoning and to reflect the multifamily. So there's um, there's a, a few other properties that are included on that request. As justification, anytime there's an amendment to the, the land use plan, the applicant provides documentation on proving whether there's an error on the map or how the project would benefit other components of the master plan. And they provided, you know, speaking to how other aspects are being improved and staff is in agreement and there's several items listed 
that touch on the concept element, land use element, and the urban development element. Specifically for agenda item four with the rezoning and the PUR, um, three other properties directly to the west of this site are zoned R7, as well as all of the other properties to the east. Across the street, there are R8 zone properties, and the whole area in general, it, there's, there's kind of a mix of what the existing zoning is. Um, so staff is, is supportive of the rezoning to R7. It would be consistent with this block phase. <clears throat> For the, I, I touched on what specific zoning code items would be part of the PUR, uh, 21 units. It is four stories in height with the ground level parking, three stories of units above, the 22 parking stalls. Um, with this submittal, there were revisions. Um, just to touch on design a little bit, Staff, um, with the PUR tool, staff follows the urban design uh, building elevation requirements. That's our highest level of design outside if a property is designated as a local landmark, which this is not. Um, so the way that staff looks at it is not, <laughs> it's a little challenging. You can't just dictate based on neighborhood. We try to try to make it fit into the neighborhood. And obviously we had a recent case where this came up a lot on disagreement of whether it fits in the neighborhood or not. Um, so there's, there's some challenges that staff faces. Basically, we review whether it complies with those urban design standards, and this project does. Now, the PUR tool does lock in place a design of a project. Now, as Jeff talked about, there are, it's not uncommon with almost every project that some of those finer details would get worked out prior to the official building permit submittal. I mean, obviously the plans that we view are not to building permit level details, and that's the case for every project. Now, to what extent these finer elements are being designed, I, you know, I'm not an architect, I don't know exactly what, what that would all look like. Um, you know, so I just wanted to point out that while the PUR does lock in place the design for the benefit of the neighbors, for the benefit of planning board, for the benefit of city council and the development team, so everybody knows what they're getting, I mean, that's, you know, there can be minimal finer detail changes that staff reviews to make sure they're in compliance. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Um, so we do have a recommendation for approval for both uh, cases. If, if the board wants to see a layover to revise elevations or to give guidance of specifics they're looking for, obviously staff is supportive to, to meet with whoever we need to meet with. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Any other additional questions or comments from the board? On agenda item number three, do we have a motion? We have a motion to approve. Uh, and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. And specifically for agenda item four, city staff recommends approval of the rezoning from R435 and R7 to R7 and approval of the PUR. And I just want to point out that uh, ultimately, City Council has um, the final vote. This is just a recommendation from the Planning Board, so uh, we definitely do encourage continue to meet, um, you know, in between the development and the neighbors. Okay. For agenda item number four, do we have a motion? I move for a layover. Second. We have a motion and a second for layover. Lisa, will you record the vote? Morris? Yes. Franklin? Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion to lay over approved. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item number five, KC 14-19-242, applicant planning department on behalf of the city of Omaha, request vacation of the east-west alley west of North 28th Avenue, <coughs> between Benny Street and Maple Street, abutting Lot 91, Block 0 of Geist Edition, and Lots 3 through 11 and 13, Block 0 of Remington Subdivision. This was laid over from the December 
meeting. Eric, are you presenting? Uh, yes, I'll start. I'll start it off. We do have uh, representatives from Public Works that have been involved in the process. If we need to bring uh, them up, we can. Okay. So yeah, so this was laid over last month. Uh, it was a little unclear at the time. We had um, but some neighbor opposition and, and come out and raise some concerns. And so uh, the board laid it over. Um, since that time, Public Works has had correspondence with the applicant of the, of the vacation request and has informed them of the payment that would be required if this were to be approved. Um, you know, you have one party that's requesting the vacation. However, it is being divided up between uh, five different properties, but the applicant would have to pay for the entire right of way uh, vacation, the appraisal price, unless their neighbors were ag agreeable to, to chipping in as well. So um, there are four properties, 2863, 2867, 2871, and 2873 Binney Street are on the north side of uh, the proposed vacated alley. Um, those northern properties would um, have the vacated portion become a part of their property. Then you have one on the south side, 2910 North 28th Avenue, which fronts to the east. Part of their driveway, um, is my understanding, is in the alley, and so it makes sense for that southern property to um, receive that portion. So. It, Unless you have any questions, we can go through the public hearing and then I can give my official recommendation afterwards. Okay. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Come forward, sir. Give your name and address, please. My name is David Lacey, 14810 Highway 36, Bennington, Nebraska. I am Miss Bigno's fiance, so I'm, I'm kind of speaking so that you guys can kind of understand a little bit better what we're saying. Uh, It'll come on. It will come on. Yeah, he's okay. Ronald turned it turned it on. It'll come up here for you. All right. Okay. We currently own the 2863 property, and there is actually a fence in the back of this property that we've went through and kind of improved it a little bit it was run down a little bit so we improved it and there was also a fence line across the alleyway and our assumption was the alley was already closed we had contacted other people and they had told us up to 30th street that that alley is all closed so we didn't you know think too much about it but then we got in touch with the city and they said that the other half was actually still open and then we we had a little bit of a run-in with the neighbor he actually came through and tore the fence out and went through that little area but he owns the property to the west which is an empty lot he owns that one and then he owned the location here at the corner where the house was tore down. He had those two properties. So he was just using the alley just to kind of go to that one to mow it. So after the fence was tore down, we just wanted to make sure that we were legal again to put it back up and we wanted to just close the alley. Okay. Eric will address your question. You just want to know if you can put the fence back up? Yes. Okay. Well, we, we have to close the alley. I, I was yeah. under the impression. So. Yeah. You told me she didn't, she didn't say no before we buy. Yeah, time. that's what I, yeah, yeah. Okay. She's just asking if we knew the fence was there before, so it was. Right. Thank you, David. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Op opponents. Opponents. That means somebody want to speak. Against it? Okay. Go ahead, come forward, give your name and address, sir. Yes, sir. Michelle Payne, 2866 Benny Street, across from uh, 2867 and the, own that property, and the property at uh, 29, 
14 North 28th Avenue. That was my mother's house that they uh, <coughs> bought, okay? Uh, my mother had a reverse mortgage, uh, which I was her, uh, what they call it, uh, power of attorney. And I said, Mom, you don't need no reverse mortgage. So I worked on the railroad for 26 years. And I used to say, Mom, you don't need to. Well, anyway, that's a long story, though. But no, I've been taking care of that property for close to, uh, I'm 71, and I, I grew up in that block where the vacant ha houses, I was 15 of us, grew up in that, that lot. We bought the house next door because we outgrew the house. But uh, that fence that I put up, I had my children, the, the, the people in the block, uh, their children would come over and play basketball. I put a, a basketball hoop up on the garage. But I put a fence there to make the uh, alley a little wider cause, and, and took the fence down, the property fence, where it was just like maybe four feet from the garage. So just to get the fence out the way and make it a little uh, wider and longer <coughs> for the children to play basketball. I did that, but I made the fence all the way across the garage wide so I could just swing the fence over to the other side so they, the fence would be it, would be, it was a swing fence. So I would just swing it all the way over here so they could play basketball. Did that for maybe like, well anyway, we played back there too when I was small, but the, but the fence was so close. But uh, that's why I put the fence up. So ha they have a little bit more room to, to play ball back there. And I feel that they do not have to block the alley because when they took the house over, it's just one driveway now to get to my property on 2867 Benny, but there's only one driveway. I would have to use their driveway to get over my property, which I have a pond over there, which I use it to store my stuff, my snow blower, uh, riding lawnmower, a few things that I don't have grass because I tore the neighbor's grass down. She asked me to tear it down for when she when I wasn't living there at 2866 Bay. But uh, in order to get a freeway to 28th Avenue, the alley would come in handy instead of trying to uh, if they're if they're there mess with their rental property, whatever they're doing over there. I I would have to jump off the curb, and if I use my car. That's, that's no good to uh, jump off the curb. Sir, if I could ask a question. Yes, sir. Is your property 2867 Benny Street? Yes, that's my And there's property. no house on the property? No, sir. Okay. Um, you should not be parking vehicles or pods on it's the lot. So I'm just telling you that the zoning code does not allow uh, parking of vehicles in a residential lot without, without a home, basically. So... I well, just wanted to point that out and make yes. sure I knew which lot you were talking about. Yes, yes, sir. But I live across the street. Does that does that matter? I live across the street. Does that matter? Then it should be parked on the property where your house is. Okay. Well, nobody told me that when I when I rented it, but now I know. Yes, sir. Okay. I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and move it. And I I was just. I don't want you to get any trouble with any code enforcement or anything. I just wanted to be clear what the what the zoning code allows. Yes. So, I mean, the vacation in the alley, yeah, I understand how you want to use that to access it, but for how you're utilizing the property would not be allowed by code. Okay. Is, is, is that, uh, could I get that in writing or can I get that some type of a... Uh, uh, you can, we can have you talk to our planning department staff and we can... We can get you some of that um, after this. You could go up to the 11th floor and ask to go to the zoning help desk, and they could help you. Okay, I'll do that, sir. Mr. Sir, I just need to clarify. Are you moving the alley um, to access 
the the lot that you own to for maintenance purposes are you actually using the as like a through um yes. uh, to, to like drive through to access your property uh, from the alley yes yes ma'am and so a fence there if the alley were vacated that would impede your ability to to use the alley in the in the rear of your no. home i guess as you, you said that i tore down the uh fence uh which one of the planning people said that uh, the people that have their cars on that on that uh, part were the alley and, the, and and going towards the uh, 28th Avenue. Mm -hmm. He said that they, they shouldn't be parked there because nobody owned the alley. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we had a little problem with the neighbors, but I told my wife, don't worry about it. They can go ahead and park there because we're not really using it. Because we own the property at 2914, the, the house that they just tore down. The, 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 and I used to clean the yard uh, before that. We used to try to uh, fix the roof. That was my mother-in-law's house, my wife's uh, mother. So I helped out, uh, me and my brothers, we helped out st taking care of it. All I can long as I can remember, because that was her great-grandmother, Miss Jackson, and I, I used to cut Miss Jackson's grass for her growing up, think whatever she wanted, because she was an older lady, but she's a real nice lady, and she was one of my mentors growing up. That's why I am the way I am now, you know. I'm not no hothead, I'm not uh, no killer, uh, I'm not no thief, and y'all got records of it. And the police would come by every day. You know, I don't have no problem. They just doing their job. But, uh, but anyway, yes, ma'am, I, I use that uh, through the way instead of taking the street, because the street is no joke anymore. They'd be flying down the street. I had to tell them to be, slow it down, but sometimes they want to get back, grow up with me. So I just kind of stopped it. And if I try to get a hump or whatever in the street, death me here. And if I say, well, I should just go call the police, you know, but deaf ear. So I just try to be cool now because they're not uh, playing anymore. They're just go ahead and shoot you. Okay. It's, it's, it's for the hell of it. And where I live at, it's, it's no joke anymore. I mean, when I was growing up, me and my brother, we used to run down the street, uh, racing siblings, whoever. But, do you have any any more to add just to this case, sir? Any anything else you want to say concerning this case? Yes. Okay, go ahead. I just feel that the alley shouldn't be blocked. Okay. Because right. there's uh, I mean, are they are they uh, neighbors? Are they? Uh, are they, what are they? They just. They just own, they just want to block the fence, I mean, block the alley. No Bas re basically, with this request, the alley would go away. The, the city currently owns the alley. If this is approved through planning board and the city council process, the city would no longer own it. It would no longer be an alley. That would be incorporated into the adjacent lots, including yours. You would have a small portion, but you would no longer be able to. You wouldn't be able to access. You would not be able to access 28th. from 28th Ave. How can you just, they just can't put a fence up around their property? But also, so it's up to the city if they, they go ahead and uh, they've made a it. They've made a request, and the city looks at alley and street vacations as whether that's something that the city needs to, main, to, to retain ownership over. So this, it's not an alley that goes through. It's not improved. There's no um, garages that, that get access from that alley. And so the city is saying that we are comfortable selling or vacating the alley to sell to the adjacent properties. And, and so they're going to encroach on my property, you say now? No. No. Nope. You would just get a small piece of land that is now the alley that would be now your land. Go to you. But there's no trespassing. There's nobody taking your land. There's nobody crossing property lines. Would you get a part of that alley that's, that's adjacent to your property. But he would lose access. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You got to use it right away. And, and every other neighbor would have the same thing. Yeah, but there's another, any other neighbor uh, that's in that uh, pathway, I mean, uh, access. 
the no, no people care. I'm I'm pretty much beside. Well, they're they're just uh, slum lords, but. Uh, But anyway, but anyway, the slum lords. Uh, uh, how many? How much profit do they have uh, going through the area? Are they accessing, uh, blocking all the alleys? All the property they have. So this diagram. Okay. Okay. okay yes, sir. This is your property, 2867. Here's yes, the alley. The colored portion, this blue out, blue portion would go to this property. This green to them. This small segment of purple would go become part of your property, the pink, and then the yellow to them. So there's no longer the alley, but you would get this small portion become part of your property. But you could not drive over this land anymore from 28th Avenue. If you were to mow your property, you would have to access it from Denny Street. Well, we haven't determined that yet, though. If, no. if it's approved by city commissioners. But, but, but how about coming from my property at 2867? And that's the alley right here, right? That's the alley right there. That entire street. Right, that's the alley. <coughs> and then that's uh, my property right here, 2914. You also own that one? Yes. Okay. So you wouldn't get any as proposed for this, but you also own this, and you'd get that. Right? Are you on this? Right. Yes, yes, right. Yes, yes, sir. Twenty sixty seven. So they want to block so it from the whole right thing next to go the away. House no more alley. Mm. Just be yard for anybody. So otherwise you, the, the neighbors they would have to move their vehicle. They they have about three or four vehicles right about right here to stop about right there. So all that would be clear. No, it's not clear. It would just be part of their property now. It would be their yard. Where the, the alley is, the alley is from 28th Avenue to here. Right, all the way at the 30th. No, it doesn't go through. It's no, I knew that. It doesn't, it doesn't go through uh, at the 2871 uh, either. You're saying it's fenced here, but there's technically still. An alley it's just here. not uh, the fence proven. should not be over the alley. No, I, that's I, an encroachment that shouldn't be there. Yeah, it was a, a fence there. Okay, I had a, I had a, yes, I had a fence going all the way around my mother's property from uh, my grandmother's place. That because there's the alley right that's here. Right. That's the alley right there, and they had a <coughs> what they called it uh, cement uh, cement. Uh, Cement, cement, kind of like a cement uh, fence, right, right there, from this right corner right there, all the way to the uh, front, front of the uh, back and porch. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I, I, I've been taking care of it all my, not all my life, but I've been taking care of it all the time, though, yeah. ever since I was a, a kid. So I, I can't really explain it because it's just. Something I did, I did though, you know. And, yep. And then when my mother uh, took over my mother's property to look over her a life and stuff like that, I went on and kind of like fixed the alley up and put the fence and made it a little bit uh, wider, like I said, in order for my kids to play basketball and things like that. But I took, I've been taking care of that property, like I said. But, but what, what, what is their intention besides? Uh, are you doing them a favor, or I mean, are, but you said they got to sell, buy it. They've requested to purchase it, which is the purchase is part of the vacation process. So, so right, but all these all these years, uh, where does the uh, grandfather clause come come in at? Uh, even such it's right? city-owned property. It's it's yeah, like well, a street the how, city how, owns. How can the city didn't take care of it? Because I was taking care of it, right? I, I can't I can't speak for it. Well, I know you probably wouldn't even around. But I'm just saying, though, sir. <laughs> but no, I, I, I come down to defend uh, uh, my right. Okay, I know it's the 
I know my property, my property, but the alley was uh, my property also by taking care. Well, no, uh, legally, but if you came around there, you'd be seeing me working and uh, taking care of that property. Where's worth, worth my money at for taking care of it? And no, you didn't say nothing about that. But anyway, thank, thank you uh, for hearing me. Thank you. I really Thank appreciate you. hearing me. Y'all you know. could have told me, go sit down. Or, uh, we, we, no, we, we're going to do what we want to do anyway. So, but, okay. but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other opponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any additional comments or questions from the board? I think I just wanted to make a comment. Um, sir, um, you you're okay. You can stay seated. I just was going to make a comment to you. Uh, we, we see stuff like this all the time. I, I've got one even out in my neighborhood where a house was tore down and a new house was going in. And there's a little bit of a dispute between the neighbors of where the property line. One neighbor said, I've been taken care of of about 10 or 15 foot and now you know along his south property line now he finds out from the survey oh that really was was never his and it, it just happens and uh, um, you put in a lot of hard work and taking care of that alleyway and uh, and I understand that you begin to feel like it's it's yours and uh, but unfortunately it, it's not but uh, I, I understand your sentiment and understand where you're coming from, and it happens a lot in this city, uh, you know, with neighbors and ground that they thought was theirs for years, and then they find out it isn't, so. Yeah, but, but it wasn't being conspiratorized, uh, taking, all, taking these people's property and the lawyer uh, to do what they do with their property, then uh, taking, taking it from them. Because my mother was 85 years old, they uh, came in there and uh, prepared to lend me. We, uh, we understand that, yeah, okay, sir. I know, I know okay. Y'all not dummies. I know that. There's All right. There. Thank you for I coming. That's why I came down and stress myself. Okay. Situation. Gotcha. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yes, sir. All right, Thank Eric, you. did you? Uh, uh, just that um, the proposed vacation is consistent with city policy regarding vacation of unneeded and or excess right away. If there are any utility easements that need to retain, um, those would have to be coordinated with, um, with the Public Works Department. So city staff is recommending approval subject to the applicant working with Public Works Department regarding the need for any utility easements. Okay, do we have a motion? Need approval subject to retaining any necessary easements. Second. We have a motion, a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Franklin? No. Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Agenda item number six, case C3-20-2, <coughs> Applicant Planning Department on behalf of the City of Omaha, request approval of the Pacific Heights TIF redevelopment project plan. Location 1217 and 1219 Pacific Street. Don, would you, you're presenting. <coughs> Uh, yeah, Don Seaton, Omaha City Planning, uh, presenting the project on behalf of the department. Um, and uh, first uh, meeting of the year, Happy New Year to you all. Uh, this uh, TIF project, tax increment financing project, is on an in, is an infill redevelopment project on a site on Pacific Street, south side of Pacific Street, just to the a little bit to the east of uh, 13th Street, south of the old market area. Um, previously, this site had contained two parcels, and each parcel had a single-family home. Both of those homes were in uh, rather poor condition. Um, one of them was torn down some time ago. The brown one you see here, this is the re street view of the redevelopment site, has since been torn down, so it's a vacant parcel right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, that helps, I suppose, see, see what's going on. Um, the proposal is to construct a new six-unit apartment building. These would be two-unit, or pardon me, two-bedroom units. It'd be a four-story building with parking on the 
first level and two apartments in each of the three levels above the parking level. Uh, there would be 13 parking spaces on the site then for these six two-bedroom units. The uh, project is uh, it's a very contemporary design. It, it's next to a building that has a very contemporary design. Uh, the applicants have worked very closely with the city urban design staff in our department to uh, um, to develop the project, and uh, it is supported by our urban design staff. Developer is Zan Properties, LLC, managed by Zach Atchley, if I have the pronunciation right. Total project cost is uh, approximately $2.2 million. They are requesting $267,122 in TIF support. Project meets the requirements of the city's TIF program. It complies with the master plan and it's appropriate land use for the area. We ask for your approval or pass it on to city council with recommendation for approval. Okay, thank you, Don. Any other proponents? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Board members, Brent Beller, 1140 West Center Road. Appearing on behalf of the project applicant, uh, Zach actually, uh, Zan Properties, LLC. Uh, here for any questions. Otherwise, I think this is a good reuse of otherwise neglected properties that were utilizing the TIF incentive uh, to redevelop into six new units. So with that, we're here for any questions. Any uh, neighborhood meetings with? Yeah, so we had two neighborhood meetings uh, back in early part of 2019. This project took a little bit of time just in the design phase and getting through the entitlements, but there was numerous meetings. Having done other projects down here in the Dolman Rose and the Dolman's Homeowners Association, uh, I know the team did a pretty good job uh, meeting with those folks early on. And what did you get for feedback on this? Well, I'm not sure. Hopefully there's no opponents here, but generally speaking, everyone has been in support of it. Um, I personally have not heard of any negative feedback. I don't know if the city has heard that, but so far, nothing negative. Okay. All right. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Additional comments, questions from the board? Eric, did you want to add anything? It just staff recommends approval. Okay. Do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Page? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Okay, agenda item number seven. Let the record show that Chris Carnes is recusing herself and has left the chambers. Agenda item number seven, case C3-20-4. Applicant Planning Department on behalf of the City of Omaha request approval of the 72nd and Center Southwest Community Redevelopment Area location southwest of South 72nd Street and West Center Road and Don you're presenting. Uh, yes, good afternoon Don Seaton, Omaha City Planning Department. I'm going to try to be fairly brief with this item, but it's been a while since we brought a CRA designation to you. CRA stands for Community Redevelopment Area, uh, so I'll need to take just a little bit of time to give some of the background and criteria for CRAs and what they're used for. Uh, may be helpful to start with a map of all the existing CRA areas in the city of Omaha. These uh, areas in the uh, colored area, lavender, I guess I could call that maybe, um, those are areas that currently exist as formally designated community redevelopment areas, designated by the city council, enabled by state law. The reason they're there and the reason they're important is because designation of a CRA opens up the area for uh, eligibility for projects to apply for our TIF program. And again, these are the areas that currently exist. The item you have before you today is a request to create a new community redevelopment area. It would be in, these are census tracts or boundaries. It's in census tract 60, 59.06 and is roughly, and my pen's not working, roughly in that area. So we have a request to create a new CRA. Now these requests to do a CRA and the department's willingness to do a CRA study, community redevelopment area. Um, we do these when we receive a request from a party that's interested in redeveloping a parcel <coughs> or property, 
and they feel that they're going to need the TIF program or the, or the <clears throat> development that they're considering would otherwise not be built or not, uh, not succeed or be successful. Um, colors don't show up really well on this map, but anyway, we received a, an inquiry from a party that's interested in redeveloping a site at the southwest corner of Center and 72nd Street. It's the site of a uh, building that was formerly occupied by a Quality, quality Inn Hotel uh, that also had a cocktail lounge called the Shark Club, it's this property right here. Um, that's the property uh, a party is interested in redeveloping. They have asked us to do an analysis of the area for eligibility for CRA designation and planning staff has uh, proceeded to do that analysis. For our study area, we chose the Census Block Group 2 of Census Tract 6906. Some of the criteria that we use out of state law to designate a CRA are uh, census statistics, so uh, it makes sense for us to do a study area based on uh, census geography or census boundaries. Um, the criteria for, um, excuse me a second, the criteria for designating an area as a CRA are set forth in Nebraska's state law, community development law. And they use the terms uh, for a CRA, blighted and substandard area. Um, it's a phrase or pair of terms that we're not real excited about at the city level. We don't like blighted and substandard. Uh, uh, we prefer to look at it as an area in need of economic investment rather than blighted and substandard. But nonetheless, those are the terms in the state law. And the state law defines the term blighted. State law defines the term substandard. There's criteria for both. For an area to be declared as a new community redevelopment area, the area must comply, meet the definition of both terms, blighted and substandard. So we embarked on an analysis of the study area. The area, for the folks in the audience, it's a little tough to see, it's in yellow here. That's our study area. And um, we found that the entire block group two does comply and meet the definition of the term blighted under state law. Um, that's primarily because the area has lost a little bit of population and because the um, buildings exceed an average of 50, pardon me, 40 years in age. Um, the, the residential area within the study area, the single family homes, and it's mostly single family homes, those were all primarily built in the mid-1950s. Um, there are some other criteria in the blighted that uh, this area did not meet, uh, particularly as they relate to per capita income of the residents and unemployment uh, um, statistics for the area. Um, so the, uh, it, it's not a highly impoverished area by any means, um, but it is eligible for meeting the blight portion of the two criteria under state law. The other criteria, substandard, relates more to the built environment. And by that I mean the buildings in the area and the infrastructure in the area uh, and what kind of condition they are in. And, and the definition speaks to uh, you know, deteriorated and declining and aging building stock and infrastructure that really is not in good shape. We take two approaches to reviewing a potential CRA area for compliance with the substandard definition. We do an extensive windshield survey. We go out and drive the area. We're looking in particular for boarded up buildings, overgrown vacant lots, um, neglected properties, uh, that kind of thing. We also use building condition data from the county assessor in determining how much to tax your property at, they like to categorize buildings by their condition. And it, it ranges from very good, good, average, fair, poor, to worn out. Okay, and trying to determine whether the study area complied with the term substandard or not, we drove the area and we reviewed the data. 
Looking at the data, you see there's only one building in worn out condition. Most of the buildings are in average or better condition. Typically, we would look for, um, in a substandard area, an area that has a fairly large proportion of its buildings in the, in the fair, poor, and worn out categories. Now, there's only 16 out of 327 here. And so that tells us from the assessor's data that the properties in the study area are really pretty well maintained, and our windshield survey certainly backed that up. Driving through the area, the homes are in good shape, the infrastructure is in good shape, the entire area looks pretty, well, most of the area looks pretty good. So as I said previously, the entire study area complies with blighted, but in looking over the data, only a portion of our study area complied with, in our opinion and from our perspective, um, with the criteria established in state law for substandard. And that's primarily, well, it's, it's exclusively this area at the uh, northeast corner of the study area. So the entire study area could be called blighted, but only a portion of it could be called substandard. Therefore, planning staff is recommending to you that we designate just the area in solid yellow. It looks like this on your, in your packets. We designate this area here, about or just a little less than four, well, about four acres when you throw in the right-of-way that's included. We go to the center line, <coughs> pardon me, the center line of the right-of-way. We are recommending that this area be declared the new community redevelopment area, the new CRA. Um, I, I would need to note a couple of things on that. Typically, when we do these studies, we like to declare an entire area or a larger area as a CRA. We try to avoid small area CRAs. In this instance, we felt that there was a necessity for declaring this particular area as a CRA because the property is so badly deteriorated, it will be difficult to redevelop because of the cost of demolition of the long vacant building that sits on the site and its deplorable condition. As you saw in the assessor's data, it's the only one in the area that's worn out. Um, so we felt it's really important to make this property eligible for TIF support but we did not feel we could uh, justify declaring the rest of the neighborhood uh, as blighted and standard based on its condition. Now, like I say, we usually like to do a larger area. We are not doing that in this case. The yellow area is the area we are recommending for the new community redevelopment area designation to you. The lavender area is the existing um, CRA designated areas. If we were to review this and it were not immediately adjacent to an existing designated community redevelopment area, the TIF committee would not have supported the idea of designating the area and neither would planning staff. So it's, it's proximity of this small area CRA to an existing CRA um, is really a fairly critical um, consideration in our analysis of this project. I'd like to add that we had a neighborhood meeting on December 12th. It's fairly well attended. Um, I think overall most of the people who attended felt that that property does need some attention and they do not appreciate the condition it is in presently. Um, some of them do have concerns about what it may end up being. But uh, any project that gets developed there will have to come back to you if it's a TIF project for additional review. For now, we're looking at just the designation of the CRA. With that, um, planning staff uh, ask for your approval in recommending this for designation to the City Council. Okay. Thank you, Don. Any other proponents that wish to speak? John Blumenthal, 1700 Farnham Street. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of the project developer, uh, Meridian Development, LLC. Uh, we're excited about this project and happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. Thank you. Any other proponents? 
Seeing none, are there any opponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Additional questions, comments from the board? Don Seaton, City Planning. Uh, this is more rhetorical because I know the answer is no. Um, but in CRA law, um, is there no mandate um, that uh, requires that a certain percentage of future residential development be at least partially subsidized um, for lower income people to factor in the affordability piece? Because I can't help but think about the case that we just approved, number six on 12th and Pacific. Um, <coughs> A two hundred thousand dollar TIF allocation. Um, if anyone noticed that the the rents are between twenty one hundred dollars and twenty eight hundred dollars a month, is there no um, no responsibility for developers that are getting this incentive in CRA districts, like a, a TIF incentive, to then offer um, at least a percentage of their units that they be subsidized? And I know the answer is oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, the answer is no. Um, you know the. The state community redevelop the community development law um, in its standards for the TIF program does not set up any requirements that uh, residential multifamily TIF projects include some affordable housing. Um, the real purpose of CRA designation and TIF projects is to bring new economic vitality into a neighborhood or an area that has not been seeing reinvestment. So, so the interest is more in providing an economic redevelopment, infill redevelopment incentive than it is for any other public purpose. Certainly affordable housing is a valid public purpose. It's a big issue in Omaha. It's a big issue across the <coughs> nation. But it's not required by our TIF program, nor is there a requirement in state law. We do have an affordable housing program and uh, home funds and CDBG funds. Our department runs a fairly strong affordable housing program. Probably the largest stock of affordable housing within the city of Omaha or any city um, is the existing housing stock in its older neighborhoods. Right. And we do have homeowner rehab programs, um, rental rehab programs for those who rent to lower income households. Um, it's separate from TIF, but it is within our right. department. Yet it's a developer incentive specific to supposedly blighted and substandard areas, um, and yet affordability is not even a, a consideration. It's or not a consideration of TIF. Yeah. That, that is correct. That is correct. It is a consideration of the low-income housing tax credit program. Yeah, it's a little uh, separate. You know. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Is there any, because you had mentioned that the you know, planning department typically <coughs> doesn't like to designate these specific parcels as you know, CRA. Is there any, and I know you get asked this all the time, yeah. you had mentioned that in our pre-meeting, is there any concern here about you know, creating this precedent moving forward where other developers could come to us and say, well, you did it for Meridian Development. Uh, mm -hmm. What's different about ours? Well, we certainly want to be consistent, but we're not terribly concerned here for a couple of reasons. One is the location. Uh, uh, you know, our, our TIF committee in reviewing this and talking about CRA designation said that smaller area TIF designations, they want them to be uh, immediately adjacent to an existing CRA. Um, so, so that's something that our TIF committee is looking at when we get these requests. Another factor that's specific to this site is, is the really deplorable shape of the building. Um, most of the older buildings that we have received similar requests for, maybe a little bit further west, um, they've certainly not been in, in this type of shape. Uh, the, this building's, I think it's been mostly gutted uh, at this point. So then, Don, would, would the CRA additionally make this um, project eligible for CDBG funds to tear down the building? Um, I, not, not it wouldn't not have any bearing on CDBG. It would either be eligible or not eligible under CDBG, kind of separate from this consideration. OK. okay. Additional comments, questions? Eric, did you want to add anything? Just uh, reiterate, staff recommends approval. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? 
Rosacker? Yes. Tate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? No. Franklin? No. Mr. Chair? Yes. Motion approved. Four to two. Okay. Um, Chris is coming, but let the record show that Chris Carnes has returned to the meeting. Uh, Eric, are we going to take uh, agenda items number 8 and 19 together? Yes. Okay. Uh, these were pulled off of the uh, consent agenda. Uh, agenda um, item number 8, case C10-19-251, C12-19-252, <coughs> applicant with Sonia Acquisitions LLC request preliminary plat approval of Lake Livin, a subdivision outside city limits with rezoning from AG to R7, location northwest of 168 and 4th Street, and we'll get to agenda item number 19, KC11-19-255, Woodsonia Acquisitions, LLC, request <coughs> approval of a planned unit development, location northwest of 168th and 4th Street. May we hear from the applicant, please? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Larry Jobin, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant with me today is Jeff Elliott of Woodsonia. Uh, also with me today is Brad Hike of TD2, the consulting engineers on this particular project. Obviously, uh, item 8 was on the consent agenda for approval, and item 19 was on the consent agenda for layover. We were willing to accept both those matters. I'll be kind of brief in my presentation. We'll hear what the opposition has to say as to why um, they believe that it should have been pulled off on at least the uh, approval, the layover. We were willing to accept that because there are some issues that we need to deal with with respect to item number 19. So um, real quick, this is approximately 28 acres. Uh, it's currently undeveloped, but it is subject to an approved preliminary plat by the uh, Omaha City Council, and that preliminary plat was approved February 14th of 2017. That original preliminary plat called for this area to be uh, 80 multifamily units. There was 28 townhome units. There were nine commercial retail mixed-use lots also within this development. Uh, the proposed project is three lots and three out lots. The out lots are for drainage, green space, and um, open space. It is a phased development, and I'll hopefully this uh, exhibit's not too large, but it's a little clearer than the one I had. So again, this is on the uh, northwest corner of 168th and 4th Street. And again, uh, the proposed development is a phased development. Uh, there is uh, 168th Avenue, kind of loops around in this regard. This, everything that is along 168th and along 4th Street would be phase two. Everything within the 168th Avenue is phase one. So everything you see here in the middle is phase one. Phase one consists of four buildings and 310 units in those four buildings. And in phase two, it consists of five buildings or and 268 units in phase two for a total of 578 units within this particular development. Even though there's 578 units, I would say that this is really a down zoning because it's all residential as opposed to the nine lots that were previously uh, preliminary platted for commercial retail and uh, mixed use uses. Uh, the uh, multifamily complex will have a number of amenities. It's market rate rents. It uh, will have a clubhouse, swimming pool, and uh, it, it, in total, it's about a $65 million project. Um, meets all the parking requirements, meets all the site regulators. Uh, we think uh, we appreciate the planning department's recommendation for approval with respect to the preliminary plat and the rezoning, and uh, we're willing to accept the layover on the PUD. PUD to work out uh, really the issues relating to HWS Cleveland as it uh, wraps around the project and uh, between the project and between uh, Flanagan Lake. Um, as part of this project, we're also um, extending HWS Cleveland from this location to this location here, and we're also extending the trail system that connects to the lake as well. Um, I'm, we, ha we did have a neighborhood meeting Back in November, there were probably, oh, eight or ten people there, I would guess. Uh, I 
thought that it was mostly um, looked on as favorably. There was a couple concerns about the, the people that had these lots right here uh, closest to this one building, which is building number three. Um, uh, the gentleman that is here, I believe, today that pulled it off the uh, consent agenda for approval lives in this house here, I believe. Now, he does look out over the outlot B, which is a detention basin. Outlot B, by definition, being an outlot, it's undevelopable. It will never be built upon, and so his view of the lake will be unobstructed. Um, I think some of the concern might be on this particular location, but what I would point out is the apartment building is about 140 feet from the property line to the actual building. And it actually, we, we have three stories on the north side of the building and four stories on the south side of the building. But the elevation and grade change, this whole area kind of drops down towards the lake. So from this point here to this point here, there's about a 90 foot drop in grade elevation. So there's a pretty significant um, change in elevation from 168th Street down to the western uh, portion of the property. With respect to this portion of the property on the north side, there's about a 12-foot drop or elevation grade change between the single-family uh, residential lot here and our um, uh, garages that are located here and then the building. With the building being three stories on this side, we're, and again, trying to minimize the impacts to the adjacent residential neighborhood, with that 12-foot grade change, you really have effectively two stories on the north side with respect to this building number three. All the other buildings are really protected and tucked away from the residential subdivision to the north. And again, this already being preliminary platted as a mixed use center and having it be a mixed use area at uh, 168th and Fort, we think again from a pure intensity rating, this is less than what was originally contemplated. So with that, we're happy to listen to the opposition to determine what their concerns are. Hopefully we can address them and we'll answer whatever questions that um, the board may have for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Please give your name and address. And Good afternoon. Uh, Terry Davis, 5720 North 169th Street. My wife and I are the first two people to move into uh, the Pier 15 neighborhood, and uh, there's only about four properties that are actually occupied at this point. Otherwise, we might have more people here to talk about this. I uh, just have a few concerns. Um, originally, as uh, the gentleman said, this was plotted as multi-use. Uh, and then it was our understanding that it was to be single-family houses, and then in November we found out that there's a proposal to make this uh, multifamily housing. Um, a couple of things. First, uh, and again, I appreciate your time and attention on this, uh, I question really the need for a apartment complex of this size in this area, 578 units. Um, some, just a couple of quick statistics uh, from something uh, called the Reese's Preliminary Apartment Trends Report in July of 2019 showed a nationwide uh, vacancy rate of 4.7% on apartments. Omaha has a 6.6% vacancy rate on apartments, so almost 50% more than the national average we have on uh, vacancy rates on apartments. So I wonder really how much we really need this uh, large of a, of a complex, uh, particularly in this area. One of the reasons being that it's out of character with the area. This is really a pretty rural area. If you look on the west side of Flanagan Lake, it's still farmland. If you go to the north end of the lake, it's farmland. Uh, eventually, obviously, it'll be developed, and it's my understanding part of the property on the west side is for sale at this point. But uh, on all four corners, uh, uh, which would include this area, so far it's all just single-family residential. There are no uh, multifamily units on this. So I think it's really out of character with the, um, the area. Second being the infrastructure around the area. Um, Fort Street is two-lane. Um, 168th is two lane, 180th is two lane. If you go west of 180th on Fort Street, until very recently it was still a dirt road. Uh, there is a new high school uh, that is being built on 180th Street. Uh, I think if you put this dense uh, housing in that area, it's going to really strain the um, 
the infrastructure, there's going to be a lot of traffic, uh, that kind of thing. Um, another thing is the effect on property values. Uh, you will hear, I believe the gentleman when we had this meeting in November talked about a Harvard study, Harvard uh, study that says that, low to, uh, that actually apartments do not adversely affect single family house values. If you look at that study and some of the other studies that have been done, they are primarily focused on low and medium income uh, properties or low and medium uh, values. If you look at higher end properties, such as is in this neighborhood, uh, houses here typically are selling between $500,000 and $750,000. Uh, there actually is a local study. Uh, it was a thesis uh, prepared by the um, and the Department of Geology, uh, Geography and Geology at the University of Nebraska at Omaha uh, in 2002 entitled The Impact of Apartment Complexes on Property Values of Single-Family Dwellings West of I-680 in Omaha, Nebraska. You can't get much more specific than that. I mean, this is where, where we are. Uh, this study showed that, in fact, uh, the farther away from apartment complexes uh, houses are in this area, the less impact there will be on values, and the closer they are to apartment complexes will decrease the value. Uh, it's specific to this area, uh, so I think you should consider something like that. Uh, tax base values, I don't know what uh, the difference is in terms of uh, how much tax revenue uh, single family houses generate versus apartments, I just don't know. Uh, obviously that's more in your bailiwick or the city councils. One thing that's sort of a maybe intangible thing uh, is frankly the potential effect on waterfowl in this area. Uh, we've only been there since April, uh, but in that time, Flanagan Lake is a very special place, I think. Uh, there are uh, Canada geese, trumpeter swans, different species of ducks, pelicans, cranes, all migrate through there. I mean, I look out in the morning and we'll see a couple hundred geese at any time. They typically will come into the fields that are surrounding the lake and will graze, will uh, eat before they're migrating. Um, if you put an apartment complex in there that is, has a lot of concrete, light pollution, big tall buildings, I think you're really going to adversely affect the waterfowl migratory uh, population through here. Uh, sure, if we put single family houses in there, we aren't going to have as many geese grazing on our lawn as we would if it was farmland, obviously. But I think that there's really going to be an adverse effect uh, on that. Um, in terms of my particular space, uh, my particular lot, uh, the gentleman was right. Uh, my view isn't particularly going to be obstructed, so I'm not here with a personal ax to grind on this. I just don't think that it's the type of thing that we need in this neighborhood. I do think that it will adversely affect property values and will adversely affect, uh, again, some of the intangibles like waterfowl migra migration. So with that, uh, happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? Uh, my name is Matthew Caniglia, uh, 4253 North 188th Circle. Um, I own Silverthorne Custom Homes. I'm here representing myself. I'm also here representing the clients um, who could not be here that um, on lot 82 have reached, recently signed a contract and actually the plans have just gone through city for approval. Um, here in the aspect of, I agree with many um, aspects that um, Terry Davis here represented. So to keep things short, I'm going to switch over to kind of as this how it specifically affects these lots across here. Um, Ronald, can you turn on mm -hmm. the, uh, okay, thank you. So currently we have 80, lot 82 here under contract and I'm also under contractual obligation to buy 84. Um, the main concern is with the cost of these lots. One, these are expensive homes. I mean, these are 90 plus thousand dollar lots. The homes that are going on them, as uh, the previous gentleman said, you know, are five and a half to seven and a half, or, or you know, $750,000, excuse me. So we feel that these apartments are, while I don't oppose the project as a whole, I oppose this section of this corner of this building the way it stands up. Um, I think without that corner or some other use of that portion, whether it be pools over there or something more low-lying structure that still, granted these houses are going to back up to apartments, but it's not impeding their view. Everybody, including myself, when we purchased or signed contracts on these lots, were under the impression with the previous or current owner that, for the most part, what they had shown us, these were unobstructed, 
excuse me, unobstructed views. And so that is the basis of me being here is my clients are actually thinking about not building a home there, which is a specific result of the way that building is designed. Um, so obviously it's a huge concern for me. How do I sell these lots in the future? How do, you know, especially a lot of that caliber. And um, also for my clients that still would like to build their home there, but seeing as if that corner in that building goes through the way it is, um, that they may not follow through with the project. Is that it, Matthew? Yes, that's it. All right, thank you. Any others in opposition that wish to speak? Hi, my name is Erin Strunk, 744 North 58th Street. I'm a real estate agent with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. My clients are those that are under contract to purchase lot 82 and build a $600,000 house. So at this point, uh, they were very excited about uh, having that nice view of the lake, uh, which they will no longer have. So the blessing for them is that they don't have to follow through and build that house. Um, they would really like to build the house on that lot if there were a modification to that building that would be obstructing their view at this time. Okay. Are there other, other lots available besides those two lots that you can There are, but there it's not that great of a view. The view, I mean, the reason that they purchased that or that they selected that lot was because of the view. So again, in, as Matt had stated, it is almost a $100,000 lot, and I would agree with the homeowner on lot 81 that it absolutely affects their value. So when they were looking at that lot and decided to buy that lot, they had to figure something was going to go in there at some point in time, right? I mean, it's always nice view when there's nothing obstructing the view. Sure, sure. So but, but as the homeowner stated on lot 81, that was it was not thought that there was going to be something that was going to obscure the view to that degree. They just thought it was going to be more single level. Correct. Because they're up on an incline. Yeah. I mean, that, those are some of the better lots. how it dips down to the, to the Flanagan Lake. Correct. Matt Caniglia, uh, 4253 North 188th Circle. Uh, we had received two preliminary plats that had gone through that I don't know if City Council had seen them or if anybody had seen them, but preliminaries that uh, the developers were working with. One had some mixed use, um, some residential, um, and then the second one was mostly residential, but then towards the outer laying parts, towards the major streets, were a little <coughs> bit of smaller, possibly commercial, uh, the way they explained it, were maybe like a Quickie Mart or a gas station or something like that along the edges. So as we purchased these properties, as things developed, um, we, you know, that's what we were in the assumption was, and that's what we told our clients, you know, this is all the information that we have at this point. Obviously something will be built there. This is what we have been given. Um, I guess the main voter concern is that this project has gotten this far and I had not received anything to my knowledge until uh, two weeks ago when I got the letter for this hearing. So I was unaware, even as a builder in the area, I've built uh, six or seven homes in that area, villas and regular, and this is the first I've heard of it. So that was my reason for being here, my main concern obviously on top of that. So yes, to answer your question, people were assuming something would be there, but not of this stature. Would be. So when you bought those lots, I assume it was typical development, you had to take under contract a certain number of lots with the developer? Correct. And you picked those lots because of the Correct. view primarily? Correct. In these lots, down this street, obviously as you come up towards lot 84 on the higher side, um, were the premium lots that were, because of the L lot and the way it was kind of arranged and what they had given us, were the only lots that would have unobstructed views. As you go down past that out lot to the north, there are flat lots that abut, that are behind the walkout lots. So all those walkout lots will have homes behind them, and they were planned that way and it was drafted that way. These lots on this street were the only ones that were quote unquote not supposed to have. Is this, are these walkouts? Years. Correct. They are. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Any other, do you want to speak in opposition? Okay. <coughs> My name is Bill Williams. I live at 16724 Ogden Circle, which is in Stone Creek subdivision. My house backs up to 168th Street and is quite close to the corner. There's one house.
closer to the corner. It's my lot looks up, my backyard looks out onto the lake, and we've lived there for 13 years. And we watched the lake being built, and we're pretty excited about it. Now they're going to build a three story apartment complex around that entire corner. And I want to express my feelings that I have the same feelings as the people before. The streets aren't prepared, aren't, right now the streets are so busy there are times you can't get out of Stone Creek subdivision to turn to the south. So something needs to be done about the streets and I'm sure there's nothing in the plan for that at this point. The streets are not well maintained right now, they're in rough shape at times. And I, I think uh, uh, 500 to 800 new cars traveling in that area is just too much. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Bill. Any others that wish to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Larry, would you come up, please? Got some issues that need to have addressed, I guess. Um, yeah, I would. One from Matthew and Aaron is the view, but uh, Terry was talking a lot about the uh, property values, traffic, <coughs> the size, 578 units. So. Right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, Larry Jordan, 11440 West Center Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, number one, we are required to perform and prepare a traffic study. We'll be required to install all public improvements that are necessary as shown by the traffic study. Um, I believe, and I think Public Works also believes, that uh, whatever improvements they may be, it's probably minimal in relationship to the amount of traffic or increased volume of traffic based upon this particular project. These are two major arterials, 168th Street, uh, Fort Street, HWS Cleveland, of course, uh, is a, a boulevard that winds all the way through the city of Omaha. Um, and, I, and I think it's interesting, and I, uh, we've been working with the planning department a lot on this, and I think their part of the recommendation report really is important to understand because if you look at the page three on the uh, rezoning and preliminary plat recommendation report and in the <coughs> land use and planning part, it talks about how this lake really took out 300 acres of developable ground that would otherwise be for residential uses. And in order to support our infrastructure and to make sure that we can afford to pay for our infrastructure, you need density and you need these types of projects to do that. Because you have a lake, 300 acres are no longer being developed, so you can focus your concentration of development at this particular corner and not really impact the arterial street systems, and especially in light of the fact that there'll be a traffic study done and whatever public improvements are required to be installed based on that traffic study will be installed. Um, so, so that's with respect to that. As far as the, um, the views, again, um, there was a tension this is a small little drawing, but let me zoom in a little bit. And this would be the north side of building number three here. Okay, so here's building number three that goes right in this location. Again, 140 feet back and a 12 foot drop in grade change. This uh, el proposed elevation shows uh, garages and then two stories on top. The, the, top of the building is about 42 feet in height. If you take off that 12 feet in grade elevation, you're about 30 feet in height. Well, a two-story residential house is probably more than 30 feet in height. It's probably 32 to 36, depending on how the pitch of the roof is. So we were mindful of the views um, to the extent we could protect them and still have the project that, that we wanted. So again, three stories here, 12 foot grade elevation, it's only about 30 feet in height that what they'll actually see um, going down. So we think that um, that isn't a bad thing. This, the mixed use center could have easily been two or three stories with other uses in this particular uh, area. As far as uh, the gentleman on. Larry, in, uh, Larry can I interrupt you? Sure. For just, um, when there's a house there, that would be 30 foot, but you got space between the house. This would be a continuous. 30 foot, so it, it, it's a continuous block. 
uh, Matthew had asked about on uh, that's building three, correct? That's building three. That's the only one. What about a, uh, anything on that, the north end of building three? Yeah, right there Oops, where your I'm finger sorry. is. Uh, asking if that could be lowered anymore. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we haven't obviously yeah. considered that at this point in time. Um, uh, the idea was, though. I'm just to, bringing it up, yes. Matt, because he wanted that address. So, mm -hmm. well, again, it's it's 42 feet in height. It's not a whole lot greater than a, a two-story house could be uh, with a significant pitched roof. Um, with the grade change, I, again, you look. You're really only looking at two stories of building elevation as opposed to three stories of building elevation. I did want to point out that the gentleman uh, that lives across in Stone Gate, or Stone Creek, I mean, uh, he's on this side of 168th Street. This is a significant fall from 168th Street down to the lake. Again, it's about a 90-foot fall in this direction as far as the grade change going down to the lake. So if you're on this side of 168th Street, you probably still can continue to look over all of these buildings to the lake. So the idea was to develop the property in a fashion that does minimize the impacts as far as visibility. I, I don't know that anyone has necessarily a right to visibility, but it was um, paid attention to as far as making sure that we didn't have, you know, a four-story building, for example, on that particular side of the development. But we did want the garages underneath with the two uh, stories uh, above. So hopefully that addresses everyone's concerns and well, I don't know if you have any so, questions so here. Let's talk a little bit further about that if we, sure. if we can. So obviously you've got to justify the costs. Yes. 578 units is a lot of apartment units, no matter how you look at it. It's a lot of units. I don't know what you paid for the ground, but it had to be pretty pricey in that area, I'm guessing. So to justify the cost, you've got to put a number of units on it to, to mm -hmm. get a return on the investment, right? If my math is right, it's $65 million dollars total project cost, that's $115,000 per unit, which is well above the Omaha average, at least in my experience, to build apartment complexes. How do we know that there's going to be a demand? I assume you're going to have to charge higher rents to, to, to justify the cost, too, well, $115,000 a unit. Yeah, I mean, they're market rate rents. Now, the other thing I would tell you that, that also requires this kinds of kind of density, and we talked about this, is, again, the traffic study will be commissioned. There may be some public improvements out here on 168th Street. There may be some public improvements on, on Ford Street. But there is this street that has to be constructed through here, which is 168th Avenue. This street connection has to be made. This, the extension of HWS Cleveland, has to be made all the way to where it uh, starts at the Pier 15 neighborhood. There's an extension of the trail system. So there's a significant amount of public infrastructure that's also required with this particular project. That is required by the developer to pay for? Yes, yeah. Okay. And, it, and this one is it's not going to be, a, and this is not going to be a sanitary improvement district with respect to these particular improvements. It will or will not be? It will not be. This is a privately, privately financed. Privately financed. Exactly. But that's all part of the construction. Cost, that's all right? part of the construction. That's all part of the cost. But, but in order to justify that. But again, having this 300 acres immediately to the northwest of this development, it, it justifies that kind of density because... What, my point, Larry, is is it's a large apartment complex. I don't care. It's just it's large. But can't you make some... Can't, can't the developer make some consolidations for the units that are... I mean, you're not talking about that many units there. Make some consolidations to make sure that, you know, those neighbors have at least a better view than they currently have today. I don't know how many units are, are part of that. But. Here's what I would suggest if, if this works for everybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, brace yourself. No, it's, 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 it's good. It's easy, Cut right? Cut a deal here, Larry? Uh, yeah. No, it, the, the thought is, is we already accepted the layover on item 19. Maybe we lay this over to look at that and see if, you know, they can't come back together. I mean, we don't lose any time in doing it that way. And we've already got one layover here. So maybe we table this, we take a look at that, we come back to you, and we say, 
yeah, yes, that worked, or no, it didn't, and this is why. Um, so maybe that's the way to handle this at this juncture, if that works for everybody else. But I, I want to answer any other questions that you might have while we're here. Um, I think you've had, I'm not going to ask you about the waterfall, uh, waterfowl, I should <laughs> say, but uh, um, I think you've addressed the uh, questions that have been raised, the concerns. Larry, uh, excuse me, Larry, were you saying just to lay over the PUD and have the preliminary plat move forward or lay over no, both items? No, over lay over the preliminary both. plat and the rezoning to go concurrently with the PUD. We might as well get it worked out together anyway, and, and they're sort of part and parcel to each other anyway, right? So um, I don't think anyone's harmed by that delay. And if we can take a look at the unit count, we can take a look at uh, Building 3 because that seems to be the, the one building that is causing the, the most problems because otherwise you heard everyone say that they don't necessarily object to right. the, the project yeah. itself. Yeah, I, I think that'd be a, a good idea. And, you know, nothing ever gets solved unless you communicate, right? Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, I'd be in favor of, of your idea, your suggestion. Okay. What? Thank you, Larry. I just, I just want, we just do have the preliminary plat. There's no final plat on the agenda. No, no, no. It was a preliminary plat, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The preliminary plat, the rezoning, and the PUD. And the PUD. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Did I say final plat? No, I, yeah, I jumped. Uh, it's my brain. I, I jumped so. ahead of the process. <laughs> 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 Any other questions for or comments for Larry? Okay. Larry, thank you. And thank you for the suggestion of the layover for both uh, agenda item 8 and 19. Sure. Thank right. you. Eric, did you want to give the cities? No, no. Um, I don't need to get into any of the details. I mean, the original layover for the PUD was some design on uh, some of the building frontages facing HWS Cleveland. So um, I don't need to get into those details at this time. Okay. Uh, staff would be comfortable with a layover. Um, I don't know what the timing of, of when this could come back. Um, we don't typically send new notices if it's going to be the next planning board meeting. So I would recommend you guys maybe check in to the planning department here in a couple weeks. If it's, if it's more than a one month layover, we do send new notices to property, adjacent property owners. And just to add to that, I, I, we still need to work with the planning department as far as the PUD and the comments in, in that regard. So I don't know if that's something that can get taken care of between now and the February meeting or if it's now in the March meeting, but we'll do what we can to move the project forward. Okay. Thank you. Are you. Did you want to say any more? N nope. That'd be yeah. We're comfortable with the layover. All right. Do we have a recommendation? I mean, a motion, I'm sorry. Uh, number nine. For uh, number eight. 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 Sorry. For agenda item number eight, we have a motion and a second for layover. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yep. Moore? Yep. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay. And do we have a motion on agenda item number 19? Motion to lay over agenda item 19. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote? Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to ask, as uh, we're at 4 o'clock, a little after, does anybody need to take a break? we got about five or six uh, cases left. Everybody f keep going. All right. <laughs> that got pulled off. <laughs> All right, agenda item number 10. Okay, C10-17-46, C12-17-47, applicant 180 Maple LLC. It's on, a uh, request is final plat approval of Antler View East, lots 12 through 20, out lots F through H with rezoning from AG and DR to MU and a major amendment to the mixed use district development agreement for Antler View East. Location southwest of 180th Street and West Maple Road. May we hear from the applicant, please? 
Uh, Bradley Hike, TD2, um, here on behalf of the applicant, 180 Maple LLC, um, 10836 Old Mill Road here in Omaha. Um, this was on the consent agenda. Um, the, I had spoken with the gentleman um, that had raised questions about uh, what was going on near his home. Um, I don't know if he wants to come up. Um, I'm not sure that he was necessarily an opponent. He was asking for information about what was going on near his home. Um, our project is west of, uh, west of 180th Street. Um, he lives in Andreessen Meadows on the east side of 180th Street. So he was within the 300 foot um, mailing list. I believe his questions relate to the 180th Street project that Douglas County is working on. Um, so uh, Eric can answer those for yeah, us. He, he, he may be, uh, mm -hmm. have, have some questions about that. Okay. Uh, Thomas Lubash, 3306 North 179th Street. I'm just looking out my back window and I got guys uh, digging holes putting stakes in, marking. They got boring machines out there. I just want to know what we're doing. Are we going to put a wall up on the 180th when they're done? How far is that pole line going to come to my house? I would ask that our public works representative, Mr. Ryan Haas, come up to better answer the design for the future 180th Street project. I'd like some copies or prints and see what design, see what is going on. Okay. Yeah, and we can definitely get you the contact for at Douglas County um, as well. So, All right. Ryan, just a second, if you would. Uh -huh. Is there any other proponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, any other opponents? Seeing none, close public hearing. Ryan, would you answer there? Yeah, Ryan Hosser. Questions, please. Sorry, yeah, Ryan Hosser, the Public Works Department. And I apologize, unfortunately, I don't have those project details. That's a, a Douglas County project. Um, I can talk with you after this to get you the point of contact of the county yeah. engineer's office that can provide that information. So. Okay, thank you. I misspoke. I thought we had that well, information. I'm sorry, sir. I misspoke. Well, I could have said that, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had closed the public hearing. Any additional comments or questions from the board? Eric. Okay, so yeah, so this was on consent for um, approval, so I won't get into many details, but this is a second phase final platting for lots 12 through 20 and uh, three additional outlots, as well as a major amendment to the overall mixed use development agreement for Antler View East. Uh, there's a combination of office and commercial lots that are part of this project and the major amendment is due to uh, some of the changes in use some of the orientation of of some of those lots um, there are a few items that the developer will have to continue to work with us prior to moving to city council but city staff recommends approval of the rezoning from ag to dr and mu S excuse me approval of the rezoning from ag and dr to mu subject to submittal of an acceptable final mixed use district development agreement prior to forwarding to city council and approval of the final plat subject to the four conditions listed in the recommendation report prior to city council okay thank you do we have a motion a motion for approval of the rezoning from ag and dr to mu subject to submittal of an acceptable final mixed use district development agreement prior to forwarding to city council and approval of the final plat subject to addressing the four conditions in the recommendation report Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you record the vote, please? Rosacker? Yes. Haight? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved 7 0. Uh, moving on, agenda item number 11, case C10 20 5, C12 20 6, applicant Lanahaw Pacific Inc. request. Preliminary, preliminary plat approval of Sanctuary Ridge, a subdivision outside the city limits with waivers to section 5399 sidewalks and 5382G streets, along with rezoning from AG to R4. Portions of the property are located within the floodway overlay district, location northwest of West Center Road and 222nd Street. 
May we hear from the applicant, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Larry Jobin, 11440 Western Road, appearing on behalf of the applicant with me today is John Coolidge of Lambert Nears and the consulting engineers on this particular project. Again, this uh, property is just um, on the <coughs> northwest corner of 222nd West Center Road. It's a very interesting and unique piece of property. The planning staff, and I believe Ryan Haas, Public Works, we went out there maybe a year and a half ago and drove through it with four-wheel drives because that's really the only way you can get through this property. It drops pretty significantly. It's about a 150-foot drop to the Elkhorn River from West Center Road. So the grades are really, really unique, and it's a um, very interesting piece of property. Uh, what's being proposed here, it's about 77.5 acres of land. What's being proposed is 109 single-family uh, residential lots. The uh, houses are expected to range between 450000 on the low side to over a million dollars each on the high side. Uh, this is called Sanctuary Ridge, and I don't know if you are familiar with the Sanctuary subdivision, but, you know, the houses there are quite amazing. And so this is, for a while we were calling this the Son of Sanctuary, but now it's Sanctuary Ridge. Um, so so uh, with that, uh, there's rezoning from uh, AG to R4. There are a few waivers that are in the recommendation report, and we appreciate the recommendation uh, report from the department, recognizing that this is within the uh, Elkhorn Special Development Zone, which is, encourages you to preserve the terrain and, and do the best you can with respect to street systems. Uh, there are uh, uh, three waivers uh, primarily. Uh, the one is the sidewalk requirement on both sides of the street. We're going to have sidewalks on one side of the street. Uh, also, there's a maximum grade to exceed. 10%, and that's really primarily between Gold Street and uh, I believe it's um, 228th Street. Uh, I, I'm sorry, 228th Circle and 225th Circle. So right about in this range, I think there's some areas where the 10% maximum is exceeded with respect to the slope, but you really don't have any choice when you uh, see this particular property, especially, like I said, when you drop down about 160 feet from center to the, the Elkhorn River. Uh, the other one is cul-de-sacs. Um, typically, there's a maximum of one cul-de-sac uh, per development. This one has five particular cul-de-sacs in the locations that you can see here. Again, really no choice based upon the topography and the existing infrastructure of West Center Road. Um, again, appreciate the recommendation report. One really point of clarification. Uh, the recommendation report provides for the approval for the rezoning, of course, the sidewalks on one side of the street waiver and the maximum grade waiver and the preliminary plat. So the recommendations of approval are for all those, but what it's silent on is the number of cul-de-sacs. And I don't know if that was an oversight or if it needs to be added to the recommendation by this board. So when it goes to council, there's a recommendation that, you know, not only is there a waiver for the sidewalks, the maximum uh, grade, but also the number of cul-de-sacs within the subdivision. Uh, city staff, there's a provision in the, the cul-de-sac section of the subdivision code that if grade uh, requires, you know, it doesn't specifically say limit to one, but um, this, the specific section um, allows for more cul-de-sacs if grade determines. So st staff determined that a oh, subdivision waiver is not necessary, but the number of cul-de-sacs being proposed are acceptable. And that's all I wanted to make sure. I just want to make sure when it went to council that there wasn't something lagging back there that we missed. So I'm good with that. Larry, where's the existing home? That's out uh, the existing home is right back here. Oops, I wish I yep. had a pen. So how do you get to it? Um, you get to it, this is a public street. And what we've agreed to do is there's an outlot B, if you notice. That outlot B comes out and connects to the public street. We actually give him more area than he needs uh, for access. So if you look at um, Outlot B's kind of an irregular shape, yeah. but it provides uh, access and a driveway to the public street system. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Thank any you. other proponents? Seeing none, are there any opponents that wish to speak? Yep, come forward, sir. Give your name and address. Uh, Jamie Meyer, 22920 West Center Road, and that is my house um, that you guys are talking about. Um, I'm not necessarily against it. I just kind of want to know what to expect during the whole process because I've never lived in a house where 
there's construction all around us. So I guess my main question is, is how wide is that driveway going from the main street into our new driveway at our house, I guess, is one of my main questions. Okay. Um, and like he was saying during presentation, there is a lot of drop and a lot of ground variation throughout this area. And the way our house sits, we are at one of the lowest points of this whole property. So I'm just not overly concerned, but a little concerned with how they're gonna grade everything where I'm not getting a lot of water into our driveway, into our existing property, so on and so forth. So we don't have excess water flowing into our, into our property, I guess. So, and then. Jamie, are, are you on a septic system now? I am. And you will be hooking up to this sewer system? I don't know. Okay. I don't know if that's right. how that works with running pipes and lines, if that's even accessible, if that's an option. It probably will be. Um, I will probably consider it. But, and how does that affect us as far as city water, um, city sewer, those kind of things? You're on your own well now? Yeah, okay. everything's independent. All right. So, I mean, I like the idea of being on city water. Um, my kids like the idea of having neighbor kids because right now there's literally nobody around us. Um, so I'm not against it. I just don't know what to expect throughout the process, I guess, okay. as a homeowner. We'll see if so. Larry can answer some of your questions. So. All right. You want to say anything? Any, other, any others that want to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Larry, would you address some of, uh, yes. Larry, uh, some of Jamie's concerns? Yes, I, um, I believe that the outlot that is created is a 20-foot driveway. So a public street's 25 feet in width as far as paving width. So this is, you know, 20 feet easement area anyway or outlot area so he can have pavement. I, I don't know if he can go the whole width or not, but, but so plenty of room for a driveway. As far as um, the MED water, um, MED gas, uh, sanitary sewer. If I don't believe he has to connect, but he certainly can if he wants. Um, it's it's a public system, so I don't think there's any opposition for us. This will be uh, developed through the use of sanitary improvement district, so everything is public in nature as far as the infrastructure. So if he wants to tap in, I believe he can. Do you have any cost or specific cost at this time? If he wanted to connect to the sewer system, no. But he, but he can also keep it the way it is. So yeah. I don't think he has to spend the money if he doesn't want to. But okay. if, he, but if you would like those public services, he certainly can. All right. What about during construction? Jamie was concerned. I, I was talking to John Coolidge, the uh, engineer on this particular project. He will have access at all times, and we'll make sure we'll work with him and, and make sure that um, he can get in and out at all times, and that there's uh, no uninterrupted access to his house I think oh yeah. the, 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 well we're required to the post construction Still stormwater fence. requirements and and during construction requirements require that we don't overburden his property with drainage in fact the, I would guess that the drainage after this with the public street and public sewer systems it will be better than it is today with the water just running freely down the hill at his house so we think it'll be a vast improvement uh, from a stormwater runoff perspective. I guess he was probably concerned during construction once all the vegetation's taken off, he doesn't end up with a front yard full of mud. And we're happy to get his <laughs> contact information and make sure we're in communication with you. And if you have concerns or there's an issue, we'll work with you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Larry. Any other comments, questions from the board? Uh, Eric? Yeah. Um, I guess just to touch real quick on Mr. Meyer's property, if he were able to be a part of the plat, that would be ideal for city staff. Now, we can't force that, but, you know, if there's any potential conversations between the two parties to, to possibly include his uh, property as a platted lot, that would be the ideal scenario. Um, so Larry did touch on the subdivision waivers for sidewalks and street grades. Obviously, I already touched on... Um, staff believing they're not need for the cul-de-sac waiver uh, and the sidewalk waiver is only a small segment on one side of the street so we think based on the terrain and um, this area we we think it's great the amount of sidewalks that are being provided with the development um, same with the street grades um, they'll have to continue to coordinate with public works and acceptable state standards uh, which they will do so um, outside of that, you know, this is a preliminary plat, so it'll come back forward with uh, 
with a final plat. There aren't too many items that I need to touch on. There's some, um, we'll have to work on some tree canopy analysis and mitigation and um, just a few of the outlots and things like that. But city staff is recommending approval of the rezoning from AG to R4, approval of the waiver of section 5399 sidewalks for 227th circle along outlot A and lot 42 and 229th street along outlot F and lot six. Approval of the waiver of section 5382 streets and alleys maximum grade for local streets to exceed 10%. And finally, approval of the preliminary plat subject to the 27 conditions listed in the recommendation report. Okay. Do we have a motion? Make a motion for approval of the from AG to our report. Approval of waiver of section 5399 sidewalks and location of roads in the report. Approval of waiver of section 5382 streets and alleys for maximum grade. And the approval of uh, preliminary plat subject to the 27 conditions noted in the staff report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Lisa, will you please record the vote? Haight? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved 7 0. Okay, moving on, agenda item number 13. This was on for approval, was pulled off the consent. Uh, case C10 20 9, applicant Reagan Pence, Lamp Ryan Anderson, request rezoning from R2 and CC to GO. Property is located within an ACI 2 overlay district. Location 3206 South 71st Street. May we hear from the applicant, please? Hi, uh, Reagan Pence with uh, Lamp Ryan Anderson, uh, 14710 West Dodge Road, um, on behalf of the owner. Um, so, yeah, this is currently zoned R2. Um, there is a future uh, project. Uh, we're unclear when that will be. This will become an office. Uh, it could be a new build, most likely an adaptive reuse. Uh, currently, the R2 is kind of in an island, surrounded and flanked by CC with ACI overlay, GO with ACI overlay, and CC. So uh, we're really looking at this as kind of a housekeeping item at the moment to get the zoning up to speed to match what's adjacent to and um, move forward with the project at a future date. Uh, this would be an ACR overlay, so when that did happen, we would have to move forward with a uh, urban design review with the city. So, okay. so again. Thank you. Any others that want to speak in, oh, proponents, I should say. I was going to say opposition, but any other proponents wish to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents that wish to speak? Need your name and address, sir. My name is Brian Riley, um, the chef operating partner at Spazia Restaurant at 3125 South 72nd Street. Um, obviously, our business sits right behind this location. Um, my concern really uh, is falling with an article that I read in the o Omaha World Herald that has stated that this property could potentially become a four story office building. Um, which obviously throws a big wrench in my system um, with the location of that building and how they would, um, where they would put the parking for this building. We already have uh, really limited parking. We actually uh, use the lot that's next to that, Ronald J. Pelagi. Um, we pay him essentially to use that, that lot and those services, and I'd really like to, to keep that that way if this was to go forward. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, express my concerns that, you know, what was sent to me on this piece of paper says that it essentially is going to be, they're going to use the house uh, and then change it into an office, the existing building. But what I read in the World Herald does not express that. So that's my, my big concern. Um, so I don't know how far that, how that goes here in the, in the council, um, you know, there's obviously other concerns. If that went forward um, with the construction, um, you know, that could be really invasive. I'm, a, you know, we're seven day a week operation, as they would need to shut down municipal services like gas, water, electrical to accommodate this kind of building, um, would be a big concern for me. You know, as Last year, we've had other projects going on down the street where they've had to take out hotels um, and they've had to turn off the water, which turned into them having to turn off the water four other times during business hours. So, you know, these 
you know, feelings of concern are very real. You know, we deal with them. We dealt with them in 2019, and it's already cost us, you know, thousands of dollars in sales. So going forward, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, my concerns are heard here. And um, there was also something mentioned in the article about them potentially lifting the house. I don't know what that means, if they're trying to move it or if they're trying to put it somewhere else. Uh, that to me seems like a really big operation and as I have trouble with semis getting in and out already I'm imagining giant equipment and everything in a pretty tight area um, and I just know that it's going to be a problem for us so and not to mention that if they did start building a large building there that they I don't think they could physically do it without being on our property and those types of things I'm not opposed to them putting an office there a dentist's office or you know, it's a rental now at this point. Um, <clears throat> you know, they've rented out to three people is what I've, what I've been told. Um, they have five cars there already or six, and if they have a party, there's more, obviously, and that creates issues for us already. So we've already had to call them and say, hey, you can't park in our lot, you know, you can't park in a business's lot, you know, and I don't want to deal with all this towing and all that stuff. I want to be a good neighbor to them. You know, we opted not to buy the property. That was probably a mistake on our part, but, you know, we're not in the real estate business. We're in the restaurant business, so, you know, we didn't feel like we wanted to tie up that kind of cash, you know. It just didn't work for us at the time. So that's really all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Any other oh, uh, pro oh, opponents? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Reagan, did you want to come forward and? Uh, address uh, some of yes, Brian's uh, just briefly, questions? Yes, um, just briefly, Reagan Pence, uh, 14710 West Dodge Road regarding your concerns a four-story office building I'm unclear where the uh, World Herald or Omaha Herald got that information but I have looked at this property and it's a postage stamp it's about a quarter acre so we're limited in parking with what we can do there's only a couple options podium with the story above it or adaptive reuse so there's only so much we can do on that property and whatever happens on that property uh, office use wise would be parked on that property so and then lastly whatever we do would have to be reviewed with the city and they would have to look at our parking okay thank you any other questions or comments from the board eric the, the only other thing that i would say oh, is that just, we, we, give your name and address again brian uh it's brian riley 3125 south 72nd is the business address um and i did speak with um the woman who actually wrote the article uh, I called her her name is uh, Cindy Gonzalez um, and she said she spoke with um, I believe this this Brett Kane uh, and I don't know who he is or any of the any of your members but I mean it's it's <laughs> just being frank I mean obviously yeah. I I'm just yeah I just wanted to make sure I mean I'm in here I'm you know it's it's yep. really important to me to not you know and it's a public article I'm assuming they're not just out sending misinformation so yeah hopefully you can <laughs> okay thank you all right thank you Brian Eric I am not personally aware of any development plans on the site um, so, yeah, the, uh, as Reagan had mentioned, uh, most of the site is R2. There is a small portion that's CC. That's why it's R2 and CC to GO. Um, the proposed rezoning is consistent with the future land use element of the city's master plan, which designates it for office and commercial. Um, yeah, acknowledging that it is a limited size site, there will be limitations to what um, could be redeveloped there. You know the zoning change would be appropriate appropriate it's surrounded by commercial and office zoning um, so we are comfortable rezoning at this time staff recommends approval do we have a motion, a motion for approval. Second. we have a motion and a second lisa will you please record the vote Pete. oh yes. debbie's here i'm Moore? sorry yes. morris yes franklin yes Carnes. yes rosacker yes mr chair yes Approve seven zero Sorry, Debbie, I didn't know you stepped in. So. I knew. <laughs> um, Thank you for coming down and spending your afternoon to yeah. be here. I appreciate it. I think that. I got a parking ticket. Oh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Can't help you with that. Okay. Thank you. You'll make that back on my next visit. <laughs> yeah, there you go.
Agenda item number 16, case C7-20-16, C10-20-12, applicant 2302M LLC request rezoning from R7 to M NBD with approval of a conditional use permit to allow surface parking in the NBD. Location, southeast of 23rd and M Streets. May we hear from the applicant, please. My name is Kyle Hazy with ENA Consulting Group, 10909 Mill Valley Road, representing the applicant. Uh, the property in discussion is located on the southeast corner of 23rd Street and M, as uh, highlighted here uh, in the black. Uh, the lot is currently vacant. We are requesting a rezone from R7 to MBD with the CUP um, conditional use permit to allow uh, surface parking within the MBD district. Uh, this MBD zoning also matches the Omaha's uh, future land use plan. Uh, the, super, uh, the surrounding zoning includes uh, MBD to the west. Uh, to the north um, is R5, which is uh, the high school. Uh, there's R zones, R7 zoning to the east and then to the south as well with some additional MBD. Uh, the reason for the rezone is for an expansion of the existing parking lot on site. Um, the, the parking lot serves the needs of the uh, learning community of Douglas and Sarpy County, which is a government ag agency. They are located up in the, across the street, Caddy Corner, in the northwest uh, corner. Uh, to give a little background, on what the learning community of Douglas and Sarpy County does. Uh, their purpose or motto is that all ch children within the learning community achieve academic success without regard to social or economic status. And they work uh, concurrently with um, the local schools and then with some nonprofit organizations as well. The existing parking lot as shown here has 23 parking spaces. They are looking to expand it to 40. Um, the applicant is willing to clean up the site to remove uh, any of the, you can kind of see in this uh, picture here, um, clean up uh, the site to remove any unused curb cuts, uh, install the sidewalks, and install landscaping as requested and shown on the exhibit. Uh, we are... We are set to uh, meet with the uh, ZBA uh, tomorrow to request the reduced landscape setback on the west parking line, uh, west parking uh, side. Um, some of the reasons that we are looking for that request is currently that right away has an 83 foot uh, width to it, uh, which allows for um, 23 and a half feet from curb to property line, um, and then um, a total of uh, 30 feet from curb to the edge of our parking lot. Uh, that parking lot that we have proposed now on this edge, trying to line that up with the existing conditions of the um, existing parking lot to make that true um, smooth transition from one side to the next. I'll make the uh, they, they use the southern portion, yes. They do? Yes. But isn't their building Caddy 24, Corner. is it on 24th Street? Uh, it's here. The building is here on this yeah, location. It's on that side. Yeah. I'll make myself available for any questions. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any other proponents wishing to speak? Seeing none, any opponents? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Any additional comments, questions? Eric. Yeah, so the rezoning to MBD is consistent with the Omaha Master Plan. Um, requires a conditional use permit for the surface parking lot in, in such MBD zoning. Um, as Kyle had mentioned, they are scheduled to be on the Zoning Board of Appeals tomorrow. Because this is a conditional use permit, um, planning board would have to be supportive of such a waiver for that to even take place tomorrow. Uh, city staff is recommending to provide the normal 10 feet of perimeter landscaping um, I understand it's a large right away, but there's um, no hardship or practical difficulty that, that we view that we could support that waiver. So uh, staff is recommending 
uh, to submit a revised site plan that provides the required 10 feet of perimeter landscaping. Um, and unless you have any questions, staff is recommending approval of the rezoning from R7 to MBD, approval of the conditional use permit to allow surface parking in the MBD district subject to the five conditions in the recommendation report. Okay, do we have a motion? I move for approval of the rezoning from R7 to MBD and approval of the conditional use permit to allow surface parking in the MBD district subject to the five conditions in the recommendation report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Debbie, will you record the vote, please? More. Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Tate? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Approved 7 0. Okay. Um, agenda item number 17, case C10 2 215. Applicant Jerry Torzon for MJA Copperfields. Request approval of a major amendment to the mixed use district development agreement for Copperfields. Location, northeast of 204th and F Street. May we hear from the applicant, please? Mr. President, members of the board, John Bachman, 10250 Regency Circle, on behalf of the uh, applicant. Uh, this is a, an amendment to the existing mixed-use agreement for one lot only in the Copperfields commercial area. That is lot 7, which is right here. Lot 7 was originally uh, designated as a daycare lot. The daycare lot has now moved to lot 8, and it's an existing building. Uh, what is proposed are 16 apartment units, 12 two-bedroom units, four one-bedroom units, uh, and there at least 30 parking stalls will be met as set forth in the recommendation report. As you know, the master plan encourages residential uses within a mixed-use area. We believe this is a good use for this particular lot. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Dylan, why did the uh, daycare move? They wanted the lot. That's where they just wanted to go? That they wanted to go there. They must have felt it was a better location. Did, uh, did you or Mr. Torzon consider anything other than apartments on that on the site? I mean, I don't know if nothing else can... It's a, it's a long, it, narrow site. Yeah, it's kind of different. Yeah, it's a very different. Um, I don't believe so. It, at this point, um, we just wanted to put a stakeholder on that lot since the daycare uh, moved to a different lot. Okay. Thank you. Any other proponents that wish to speak? Seeing none, are there any opponents? Name and address, please. Right. Happy Wednesday, board. John Major, 20213 Nina Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68130. I may be the last man standing for us in Copperfield the subdivision, but uh, I'm not the only one that sees this to be an issue. Um, it's a major amendment and, you know, raises concerns for our home values. You know, when we purchased this, we did a lot of research as far as any, um, you know, you know, commercial zonings. And, you know, when you're making a, a large financial decision for your family, it's certainly something that goes into it. And quite frankly, we would have not purchased this home if we were aware of something like this going in uh, so close to home. Um, there are a few sections that are, are concerning. They did not submit or provide the height or elevation design. Um, in another section, the Omaha Municipal Code requires 30 feet buffer yard between the CC Community Commercial and the R5 zone. A suggested change to 20 feet, but we're still not okay this okay with this um, you know we're I mean 30 feet buffer against low residential put in place for a reason should be enforced on the design there are no trash enclosures um, office use has far less trash I mean the idea of frequent beeps and constant trash pickup is I mean it's not favorable if this was to pass though at the minimum we would need the increase in landscape buffer. Current, uh, currently, they're saying, you know, one to 500 feet. Um, you know, this should be at least every 50 feet. 
Um, and then, you know, of course, I mean, the, the higher density is just the amount of noise uh, being so close to a residential subdivision. Um, you know, and I mean, of course, there's been different studies, but, you know, three to $400,000 homes, typically, I mean, I'm in the real estate field, and typically you see a three to 5% reduction in value when there are, um, you know, apartment multifamily residential areas very close. John, does your house back up to this uh, property? Ours is not directly. We're, um, we're off of Nina, which I don't I have on my phone, but now we're, which Mr. Rozaker would know. John, when you did your uh, due diligence before you bought there, was the 30-foot buffer yard, that was one of the things that was important to you? Because you knew something, a mixed use, some type was going to go in there. Right. Yeah, I mean, we were under the impression that it would be office retail. But was the, uh, my question is, was the buffer yard being 30 foot, was that acceptable to you? And now that it's 20 foot, that's not acceptable? It's concerning. Okay. part of when you were buying your home the agreement that was in place for right I think there's a gymnastics yeah. facility there mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken yeah, right Metro stars so if they would have if they would utilize that space as well would you know taken up that space would you be okay with something like that yeah metros I mean they're, they're I, good neighbors and yeah I feel much we feel much better about that than an apartment. Um, an apartment complex. Okay. Any other questions for John? Thank Did you meet with the developer, John? Uh, me personally? I, I mean, is anybody in the neighborhood that you're aware of? Or? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. okay. Any others? Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank Any you. others in opposition? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Did you want to come forward, John? And this buffer yard has kind of got me concerned here. The uh, planning staff has recommended a 20-foot buffer yard, and we're okay with that. Um, the reason it's got me concerned is because the people like John went out and did their due diligence, and even though they know that it's going to be some type of commercial use there, it's going to have a 30-foot buffer yard. But when you're in the mixed-use areas, those buffer yards have the ability to uh, change because okay. there's no when we do the mixed use there's no specific plans for each particular lot particularly when this subdivision was developed seven, 15 years ago we didn't do the detail at that time that uh, we do now when we uh, do our mixed use agreements but the 20 foot as recommended by staff is acceptable to us did you have a, a lesser amount of buffer uh, uh, originally in the plans yeah. 10? Because <clears throat> part of the recommendation says increase the buffer yard between the CC and R5 to a minimum of 20. Yes, feet. we're going to have to revise our site plan a bit to accommodate the 20-foot buffer yard, but it we can do that. You can't do it with 30? No. That that lot's too narrow. You know, I know it's a narrow lot. But yeah, that that's the problem with this lot. It's too narrow. But you applied for 10-foot 10, 10 knowing that that was well below the the standards. I guess that's what was applied for. Unfortunately, <laughs> I was just I was just drafted to do this today or on Monday. Yeah, uh, get a job. John, to ask John's <laughs> or answer John's question: that is, is that a uh, on the south end? Is that a an enclosure for trash? There's, uh, there's there's a little piece of something sticking out there to the south. Say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and John, the the developer will provide adequate screening so people don't have lights coming into their homes. A absolutely. Well, and and there's going to be a lot more detail provided to staff before this can even be constructed. And that's a big concern of mine because I'm, I'm familiar with that, obviously. And anybody parking there facing east, their lights are going to go right into the first floor 
or the main floor of those those uh, villas that are there because it drops down the, and the villa sits right at that level. So. And, and staff has proposed a very dense landscaping along that east side okay. and that will be done. Okay. Uh, this developer also owns the nursery so there will be plenty of uh, uh, nice landscaping put on this project as he does in his other projects. I just as a side question totally but did uh, did, did uh, Jerry put in that road? Yes. The road is now in. It was requirement when the uh, daycare was constructed, so it's a through road now. But Jerry put it in, not the daycare. No, Jerry put it in. Okay, well, it's it's failing on its uh, erosion control right now, so just pass that on. I will. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Any other comments or questions? Eric, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, um, to Mr. Major. Um, brought up the the one per 500 square feet so I just wanted to clarify how that works um, yes yeah, staff is recommending to increase the buffer yard to 20 feet but to landscape it such as the 30 feet 30 foot buffer yard was in place so the one per 500 square feet is based on the area of the yard basically that that buffer yard so if you had Let's say it's 100 feet wide and you had a 30 foot buffer yard requirement. You take the 30 times the 100 feet divided by the 500 and it gets you to the number of plantings. So we're saying to plant it um, subject to the 30 foot if that was to be required. Now, one thing I did forget to mention in the pre meeting is, is something that, that we had considered if this site was just pulled out of the mixed use and it was zoned R6 there would be no buffer yard requirement from the R5 to the R6. So those homes adjacent behind are R5. Now there would be a setback requirement and you know, I'm not saying the, the plan, it would probably have to come off the street more. And you know, when we looked at that and the consideration of, of pulling the building up closer, which the mixed use agreement allows, um, that is kind of where we came w with the buffer yard because it, it is a narrow site. Um, but, but I understand concerns. The other item for the major amendment um, eliminates the 10% office requirement with these smaller centers. Um, it can be challenging, but with the proposed multifamily and the existing civic with the daycare and the, and the other office, or the, not the office, but the other retail businesses, um, we feel that that is, is acceptable. So you can ask me any questions, but staff is recommending approval of the major amendment to the Copperfields agreement subject to the two conditions listed in the report okay do we have a motion so Sydney, did you say okay do you want to uh get, give us some more complete uh motion if you would please the buffer yard between the cc and r5 zoning district to a minimum 20 feet with landscaping Submit five acceptable signed copies of the agreement prior to forwarding the request, the request to City Council. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second. Debbie, will you record the vote, please? Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Parnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Hate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Mr. Chair? No. Um, I think that's that was our last agenda item. Uh, last uh, month, the month of December, the pre-meeting minutes, we need to have a motion for approval of those. Motion approves the minutes from the pre-meeting of December. Second. We have a motion and a second. Debbie, will you record the vote, please? Uh, Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Carnes? Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris, yes. Mr. Chair. Abstain. Well, Do we have a motion for the public minutes from move December? Can I move to approve the minutes from the um, December 4th meeting? Second. We have a motion and a second. Debbie, will you record the vote, please? Can I? Okay. Uh, Carnes. Yes. Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. 
Mr. Chair. Abstain. Okay. Officers. Then we have officers. Um, do we have a motion for chairman? We have a motion and a second. Debbie, will you record the vote? Uh, Rosacker. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped on it. Proponents, <laughs> opponents. <laughs> Rosacker. Yes. Pate. Yes. Moore. Yes. Morris. Yes. Franklin. Yes. Barnes. Yes. Mr. Chair. I'll vote for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Do we have a motion for vice chair? Chris Carnes. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Did you, Patrick, did you second? Yeah. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Debbie, will you record the votes, please? Uh, Rosacker? Yes. Pate? Yes. Moore? Yes. Morris? Yes. Franklin? Yes. Carnes? Yes. yes. Mr. Chair? Hell yes. Well, thanks. <laughs> Do we have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Debbie, will you record the vote, please? Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Everybody say yes. Yes. yes.